We are now transitioning. We are now transgender. We are assigned male at birth, but we identify as a person who's researching parentism. Okay, now we're off to a bad start because I just searched Perinism on YouTube and the top video is from Bad Empanada and the fourth video is this stream right now. So I don't think YouTube is actually going to be that helpful when it comes to learning about Perinism is the problem. Maybe we can learn about how the movement persists 70 years on. Let's dip our toes in this before we start into the Wikipedia reading, okay? We'll we'll get we'll do the Wikipedia portion. Don't get me wrong, but let's 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 brush up a little bit, you know? Let's brush up a little bit. Is that really it? Man, that's really it. People also watch. That's it. That's that's pretty crazy. They came from across this vast country, trade unionists, neighborhood and youth groups and feminist organizations, often disagreeing on many things, but united at this annual gathering under the banner of Peronism, the most powerful political movement in Argentina. Poverty and unemployment are high, inflation is rampant and the country... What, what, what do they say about Argentina, that it's the world's only country that is both first and third world? Um, Argentina is wild, man. Weighed down by foreign debt. The government struggled in last month's primary elections and faces crucial congressional elections in November. The Peronist movement, which both backs and criticizes the government, says it has the answers. We've got a Peronist government. We should probably criticize more since some of their proposals are not working. We need to generate... This is useless to me. It was 1946 when a military official named Juan Perón became the president of Argentina and changed politics forever. He embraced Argentina's laborers and bettered their lives with medical care, paid holidays and a minimum wage. His policies became known as Peronism and were made enormously popular with the help of his glamorous wife, Evita. Nice. Love a glamorous wife. Love a wife guy. Love a husband uh, girl, I guess. Okay. Uh, since Peronism is a very Argentina-specific ideology, I feel like the first thing we need to do is learn a little bit about Argentina. I don't know that much about Latin America because, um, you know, I tend to learn about countries and their history in the context of modern conflicts like, you know, Ukraine or Israel or whatever. And um, in, since I started streaming, there has not been a big conflict in Argentina or, in fact, in Latin America. Not a conflict, well, they're having conflicts, of course, but not in the way that sort of centered international attention. So let's, um, let's start by learning about what an Argentina is. Let's try that to begin with, okay? It's a big country. It's all the way down here. I know that there are penguins here, like warm penguins, right? So in Neon Genesis Evangelion, the warm penguin that Misato has, that's from Argentina, maybe. It's from, it's from the area, I think, okay? Yeah, warm penguin. Hold on. Warm weather Argentina penguin. This part, this is important to understanding Peronism. Ma Magellanic penguins are found in warm climates along the coasts of Chile and Argentina. Aww, look at these little guys. Oh, terrible picture. Let me find a better picture. Look at this little guy! Unfortunately, the title to the article this picture is attached to is Climate Change is Killing Baby Penguins in Argentina, so enjoy him while he lasts. Earliest human presence, Paleolithic period, that's a little bit farther back than I need to go. The Inca Empire expanded to the northwest in pre-Columbian times. Inca Empire, super interesting. Uh, the country has its roots in Spanish colonization, successor state of the vice reality of the Rio de la Plata, a Spanish overseas vice reality established in 1776. Huh. Is that a coincidence or was it founded in 1776 for a reason? It's interesting. Fight for independence, 1810 to 1818, uh, followed by an extended civil war, lasted until 1861. An extended civil war that lasted until 1861, a series of civil conflicts of varying intensity that took place from 1814 to 1853. Jesus Christ! Okay, all right. Well, that's a long time, I feel. 
Well, we don't need to get too bogged down that far in history. Culminating in the country's reorganization as a federation, the country thereafter enjoyed relative peace and stability. Oh, no, 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 no. With several waves of European immigration, mainly Italians and Spaniards, influencing the culture of democracy, following the death of President Juan Perón in 1974. Whoa, we just skipped a fucking century there. This is the opening summary. Well, yeah, you got just a very basic background, a very simple, you know, very, very quick run up on the important details that you need. Did the good guys win? I don't even know if Perón is a good guy or not. I still need to. I don't know shit. That's what we're here for. In 1912, President Roque Sanz Peña enacted universal and secret male suffrage. Secret? Oh, like whether like who you vote for isn't public knowledge. OK, which allowed Hippolito Yigoyen, leader of the Radical Civic Union, to win the 1916 election, he enacted social and economic reforms that extended assistance to small farms and businesses. Argentina stayed neutral during World War I. Wow. The second administration of Rigoyen faced an economic crisis precipitated by the Great De uh, Depression. In 1930, Rigoyen was ousted from power by the military, led by José Félix Uriburu. Although Argentina remained among the 15 richest countries until the mid-century, this coup d'etat marks the start of the steady economic and social decline that pushed the country back into underdevelopment. Man, it really is just juntas. Junta, junta, junta. All the way down in Latin America, dude. It's the whole, like, that's the whole goddamn, it's everything. Everything that happens here. God damn it. Uribe ruled for two years, then Augustin Pedro Justo was elected in a fraudulent election and signed a controversial treaty with the UK. Argentina stayed neutral during World War II, a decision that had full British support but was rejected by the U.S. after the attack on Pearl Harbor. In 1943, a military coup d'etat led by General Arturo Rawson toppled the democratically elected government of Ramon Castillo. Wait, I thought the person in charge was this guy. When did this guy become powerful? Served as president from June 27, 1942. Okay, so he was only around for one year. Okay. So they, after the military junta, they had one year of a democratically elected government who, who then got overthrown by another military junta. Under pressure from the U.S., later Argentina declared war uh, on the Axis powers. On the 27th of March, a little late to the party, during the Rawson dictatorship, a relatively unknown military colonel named Juan Perón was named head of the Labor Department. Hmm... Peron quickly managed to climb the political ladder, being named Minister of Defense by 1944. Being perceived as a political threat by rivals in the military and the conservative camp, he was forced to resign in 45 and was arrested days later. He was finally released under mounting pressure from both his base and several allied unions. He would later become president after a landslide victory over the UCR in the 1946 general election as the laborist candidate. Nice! The Labour Party later renamed the Justicialist Party. God damn. The most powerful and influential party in Argentine history came into power with the rise of Juan Perón to the presidency in 1946. Interesting. Okay, let's learn a little bit about this Juan Perón guy. Gotta say, looking at him from here, not liking the vibes, to be honest with you. The, like, dinner jacket with the sun emblem on the sash. Very drippy, but also looks very, I don't know, Mussolini-esque. You know what I mean? Very like, yes, yes, yes. I don't know. He has the same face the sun has. Oh shit, you're right. Wait. Oh my god. It's the same face. He is the sun. Impressive. Okay, let's learn a little bit about this guy. It's John Argentina. I mean, basically, yeah, right? Born 1895 in Roque Perez, Buenos Aires province. Okay. Son of the de Debida, uh, originally Spanish, uh, but spettled, settled in Spanish Sardinia, from which great grand. So, so he had Spanish, British, and French ancestry. Hmm. Always a red flag, right? Peron's great grandfather became a successful shoe merchant in Buenos Aires, and his grandfather was a prosperous physician. His death in 1889 left his widow nearly destitute. His father purchased a sheep ranch. Juan himself was sent away in 1904 to a boarding school in Buenos Aires. 
directed by his paternal grandmother, where he received a strict Catholic upbringing. Okay, so far this guy's background seems like it's nothing but Hitler particles. He had like small business owner parents. He was raised strictly Catholic in a Latin American country, and he takes pride in his European ancestry, you know? Um, I gotta say, the immediate vibes are not great. The um, youth entered the National Military College in 1911, age 16, and graduated in 1913. He excelled less in his studies than in athletics, particularly boxing and fencing. Cool. Began his military career, uh, da, 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 leading from his forestry, instructor's credential. In 1929, was appointed to the Army General Staff Headquarters. He married his first wife, Aurelia Tizon, uh, or Potota, as Peron fondly, uh, fondly called her. Does that mean potato? Did, did he call his first wife Potato lovingly? That's so cute. I, I think that's very cute. No, that doesn't mean Potato? What does that mean? It does not mean that? Then tell me what it means. Chat seems to believe it means Potato. Big ass? It means big ass. Well, that's even better. Was it big? I mean, it might be. They became a couple, and Perón affectionately called her Potota, a childish play on the word preciosa, meaning precious. Oh, okay. What are you, are you, are you all saying it's f***ing big? She's Latina, of course it's big. Okay. Is she Latina? <laughs> because, again, we're talking Argentina here. We genuinely, like, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. In French, they say mon petit chouchou, meaning my little cabbage. God, I hate French. Unbelievable how much I hate that disgusting language. Vosh, yes, white Latinos are still Latinos. No, 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 I agree, but it's very possible for a person in Argentina in this time to not even be Latin. <laughs> like, e like to be white and not Latin, right? You know, I'm, it's just, I, I'm just commenting on the, um, the preponderance of red flags in this guy's upbringing, okay? She was the daughter of Tomasa Erastarbe and Cipriano Tizon, which sound pretty Latina. Nah, those sound like German names to me. Recruited by supporters of the director of the War Academy, General Jose Felix Uriburu, to collaborate in the latter's plans for a military coup against President Hippolito Yugoyen of Argentina. Perón, who instead supported General Augustin Justa, was banished to a remote outpost. Okay, so early on this guy opposed a military coup, or he just supported another candidate for a military coup? No, this guy was just another coup guy. Okay, so he... So, um... Peron took sides in the in the coup. You know, he 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 had he had strong opinions. C Cooist infighting. He was promoted to the rank of major the following year and named the faculty of the Superior War General. Time of resistance, a military attaché in the Argentine Embassy in Chile. And just teaching. His wife was diagnosed with uterine cancer that year and died on the tenth of September, age thirty six. The couple had no children. Oh, that's really sad. The Argentine War Ministry assigned Peron to study mountain warfare in the Italian Alps in nineteen thirty nine. Uh, dun, dun. hold on, wait, guys, the red flags, hey, don't mind me, uh, just going over to 1939 Italy to study, uh, military tactics, mmm, attended the University of Turin for a semester and served as a military observer in countries across Europe, holding positions as a military attache in Berlin and in Rome, hmm, he studied Mussolini's uh, Italian fascism, Nazi Germany, and other European governments at the time, concluding in a summary, Apuntes de Historia Militar, notes about military history, first published in 1932, second edition 1934, that social democracy could be a viable alternative to liberal democracy, which he viewed as a veiled plutocracy, or to totalitarian regimes, which he viewed as, oppre as uh, oppressive. Wait, did he... Wait, did he travel to in Nazi Germany to write a treatise on, like, third positionism, but the good kind? Like, he went over there and he was like, having studied the liberal democracy of the UK and the fascism of Germany, I have concluded that social democracy might be- Wait, wait hold on, that's the good ending! Is He goes over there and he's like, sipping a cup of coffee and he's like, hold on, I think there might be issues with these ideologies. This guy literally did the reading Mein Kampf on the subway and shaking your head constantly so people know that you disagree with it. Like, Traveling over to and learning from uh, military advisors in Berlin and Rome in 1939 while shaking my head vigorously so people know I support social democracy instead. 
He did the Hegelian dialectic for real. Yeah, honestly, pretty impressive for a military officer to come away with that impression. You know, you'd think he'd just be like stunned by the, you know, martial efficiency of Nazi Germany or whatever. He went backwards through the right wing pipeline. God damn. He returned to Argentina in 1941 and served as an army skiing instructor in Mendoza province. 1943 coup d'etat was led by Rosen against Ramon Castillo, who had assumed the presidency a little less than a year earlier as the vice president of Roberto Maria Ortiz following Ortiz's resignation due to illness. As a colonel, Perón took significant part in the military coup by the GOU, the United Officers Group, a secret society. Wait! Uh-oh. Wait, we're back in the red flag. <laughs> a secret military society, which staged a coup d'etat. Hold on started to operate at some stage in the early 1940s after Colonel Juan Perón's return to Argentina from Europe in 1941. Perón wrote that people that came to join the GOU shared his ideas about the promotion of trade unions and labor rights. What? Man, dude, this this guy is the most fucking like whiplash. This, this is the this guy is the most fucking like it's so fucking over. We are so back historical like ah uh, yeah i went over to uh, uh uh mussolini's italy and nazi germany to learn why social democracy was a preferable alternative to fascism and then i came back home and founded a secret military club uh, to commit a coup and we united based on our shared interest in trade unionism like what do, what are you doing <laughs> okay this this guy's doing a, a f bit you know like it, his whole his whole thing is giving people whiplash reading his wikipedia article all i'm hearing is a multitude of vine booms literally yeah and he wanted to prevent further acts of electoral fraud in the manner of the infamous decade of 30 to 43. however perone was concerned the gou might merely aim at carrying out a coup d'etat without planning in advance the social changes they intended to implement okay all right as with most secret societies secrecy makes historians work difficult <laughs> Little information exists about the GOU. Felipe Pina suggests GOU members were nationalist sympathizers of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, but Noberto Galasso argues there was no conclusive evidence for that in the documents, reports, or confirmed events. Silvano Santad Santander wrote the book Tecnica, Tecnica de una Tresión technique of a treason, with documents that would prove that Juan Domingo Perón and Eva Perón were agents of Nazism. Uruguayan Eduardo Victor Haida were accused as well, which motivated an investigation by the Uruguayan Congress. It turned out the documents used were forged. There is also a resolution supporting Adolf Hitler, but it is considered another forgery. What? Dude, literally, this whole wiki article. Ooh, 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 over and over and over again. Jesus Christ. Yeah, wacky leftism, dude. Jesus. This guy's life story is like that, um... What, the, 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 uh, the political, the political compass, like, bouncing ball meme, you know? Colonel Perone. This meme was for sure made by a leftist. One hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's enough. It's enough copyright bait for one stream. Um, okay. Any any time you have like an ideological whiplash, okay, that's called a uh, Peronist moment. All right. Okay. So we have learned about the secret military society he formed to start a coup, but in an anti-fascist way, actually. Against the conservative civilian government of Castillo, at first an assistant to Secretary of War General um, Edelmiro Farrell, under the administration of General Pedro Ramirez, he later became the head of the then insignificant Department of Labor. Perfect job for the guy. Perón's work in the Labor Department witnessed the passage of a broad range of progressive social reforms designed to improve working conditions, and led to an alliance with the socialist and syndicalist movements in the Argentine labor unions, which increased his power and influence in the military government. Huh. Okay. After the coup, socialists from the CGT N Degree 1? What in the ever-loving f*** is this name? Number 1? That's, that's just number 1? Okay. That's the way Spanish people type number 1. How the f*** am I supposed to know that in Latin America they say number with a degree? This this is degree in U.S. English, like like temperature, or possibly like degrees on a compass, maybe like angle. It's a different symbol. It's a tiny little up dot. What do you want? It's supposed to be like an O. 
Oh, well, I've never seen it before. It's pretty common in other places. I I'm only an American. Look, literally, on Wikipedia, degree symbol. A little, a little dot, little circle. Degrees of temperature or resident degrees of an arc. Go further down. I'm not denying that you guys use it differently. I'm just saying this is why I assumed it meant degree. I'm not dis- I'm not- I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that as an American, this is the only way I've ever seen that symbol used. It's a superscript O, not a degree symbol. It says right here, degree symbol! CGT and degree symbol one labor union through mercantile labor leader Angel Borlengi and railway union lawyer Juan Etilio Bramuglia made contact with Peron fellow G uh, GOU colonel Domingo Mercante. They established an alliance to promote labor laws that had long been demanded by the workers' movement to strengthen the unions and to transform the Department of Labor into a more significant government office. Peron had the Department of Labor elevated to a cabinet-level secretariat in November 43. Holy shit! Dude, this guy, this guy and his gigantic balls can working with the secret society and the military, uh, elevating the Department of Labor to a cabinet position. Jesus. Following the devastating 1944 San Juan earthquake, which claimed over 10,000 lives and leveled the Andes range city. Holy shit. Peron became nationally prominent in relief efforts. Okay, so he, he springboarded off a disaster. Pretty common way to attain uh, popularity. Junta leader Pedro Ramirez entrusted fundraising efforts to him, and Perón marshaled celebrities from Argentina's large film industry and other public figures. Okay, this guy, Pedro Ramirez, like, they are doing a terrible job of identifying potential threats within their underlings, you know? Like, hey, here's an extremely ambitious guy, you know, we don't know that he participated in a previous coup, he runs a secret military society, he traveled around the world, he wrote a book on the viability of social democracy, then elevated the power of the Department of Labor, and now he's gaining a bunch of attention after the fucking San Juan earthquake, and I'm gonna give him a bunch of money in order to, to, to help. Are you- dude, <laughs> holy shit, do you know? Do you know? Do you want to be shot in the back of the head? Oh my god. For months, a giant thermometer hung from the Buenos Aires obelisk to track the fun rating. Hmm, I wonder what symbol they use to indicate the, the degrees. Uh, Buenos Aires obelisk? Huh. Didn't know this existed. That's pretty big. That is indeed an obelisk, yeah. N nice obelisk. Built by the German company. Completed its work in a record time of 31 days?! Dude, we used to know how to build things. By we, I mean all humans, I guess. What the f***? We, we can't even repave a street in, in, in 31 weeks now, and now it's like, okay. They speed ran that shit. We used to build obelisks. That's the real problem with modern society. Not enough obelisks. God damn! To be fair, it's Germans, they're efficient. Germans used to build obelisk in 31 days, now they can't even build functioning EU member state in 31 years. No, nothing. Oh, look, uh, top surgery scars, trans representation. If there's one thing Latin America has in common, it's that they love football. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, the degree to which, um, Latin America likes football, uh, like, scares me. Like, unironically. I feel, I feel like we, we would have, like, a rumbling situation under the wrong circumstances where, like, they would just march across the world and flatten all civilization in their wake. If they got, like, a bad outcome or something, or, or I don't know, like, the, be, because, like, the, the, what's the, what's the organization called? Is it FIFA? Those guys are corrupt as man like if we if we're gonna take down that corruption or what if we make everyone mad in latin america like they're gonna they're gonna kill us they're gonna kill us no they all hate fifa too oh okay that's good um okay the effort success and relief for earthquake victims earned peron's widespread public approval at this time he met a minor radio matinee a matinee star uh eva duarte hmm named eva curious 
Following President Ramirez's January 1944 suspension of diplomatic relations with the Axis powers against whom the new junta would declare war in March 45, <clears throat> the GOU junta unseated him in favor of General Edelmiro Ferrell. For contributing to his success, Perón was appointed Vice President and Secretary of War. While retaining his labor portfolio, as Minister of Labor, Perón established the INPS, the first national social... Whew, thought it said National Socialist for a second. Whew. Insurance system in Argentina settled industrial disputes in favor of labor unions as long as their leaders pledged political allegiance to him. Oh, no, no, no. Hold on. Guy, wait, is this is this guy literally just like the Argentina um, Huey Long? Is that is that literally this guy? I think it might be. I think this guy might just be Argentine Huey Long. Oh, that's such an easy way of thinking about it. It tracks perfectly. Oh, man. Who's Huey Long? Uh, America's uh, Juan Perón. And introduced a wide range of social welfare benefits for unionized workers. Employers were forced to improve working conditions and to provide severance pay and accident compensation. The conditions under which workers could be dismissed were restricted. A system of labor courts to handle the grievances of workers were established. The working day was reduced in various industries and paid holidays and vacations were generalized to the entire workforce. Peron also passed a law providing minimum wages, maximum hours, and vacations for rural workers, froze rural rents, presided over a large increase in rural wages, and helped lumber, wine, sugar, and migrant workers organize themselves. Turning out pretty good so far. From 43 to 46, real wages grew by only 4%, but in 45, Peron established two new institutions that would later increase wages. The Aguinaldo a bonus that provided each worker with a lump sum at the end of the year, accounting to one-twelfth the annual wage, and the National Institute of Compensation, which implemented a minimum wage and collected data on living standards, prices, and wages. Leveraging his authority on behalf of striking abattoir workers and the right to unionize, Peron became increasingly thought of as presidential material. Okay, <clears throat> I can already see the issues here. I, I can I can already see the issues here. Unfortunately, I already see I already see where this is going to go. You can tell just from this. I feel Argentina is not a first world country. It's not America. It's not the UK or whatever. There are consequences to improving conditions for the working people. You have to balance out your labor right development with smart measures that increase or at least maintain levels of investment and maintain like a strong economy uh, internationally. Make sure that your like import and exports are doing well. What, what I'm feeling like, what this feels like, is he's basically, like, doing a bunch of good things without the meat to back it up. Like, a lot of these decisions feel like they make you very popular very quickly, and it's like, oh, why didn't people do that before, you know? But then it's like, okay, you know, this has to be substantiated. It, it has to be, um... Uh, 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 sort of materially supported by a very robust economy. It's not enough, you know, to just um, redistribute wealth from the government. No, Vosh, Argentina had a similar development index to the USA and England at this time. Like, in, in terms of, like, um, import and export markets, what was their economy like in 1940? Argentina economy, 1940. I mean, their economy did go downhill, so we know that at some point that did happen. By 1913, Argentina was among the world's 10 wealthiest states per capita. God damn. Uh, outgrew Canada and Australia in population, total income, and per capita income. Beginning in the 30s, the Argentine economy deteriorated notably um, because of military junta. In macroeconomic terms, Argentina was one of the most stable and conservative countries until the Great Depression, after which it turned into one of the most unstable. Successive governments from the 30s to 70s per pursued a strategy of import substitution to achieve industrial self-sufficiency, but the government's encouragement of industrial growth diverted investment from agricultural production, which fell dramatically. Um, interesting. Holy shit. Look at this US dollar Argentina currency exchange rate graph. Oh my god. Look at that inflation, dude. Holy shit. Zoom. Developing labor, developing labor rights is not necessarily something which happens to the detriment of your economic development. That's, that's like, that's like liberal horseshit. That's like austerity policy bullshit. That being said, hmm, I guess I'll see how it goes. I mean, we'll see how it goes, right? It is, it is possible to like sort of 
economically shock a country with with uh, labor developments in a way that leads to like a, de a decrease in in uh, uh, foreign investment or um, whatever else. That's that's my like red flag here. But I guess we'll see how it turns out. What about the tiger economy's built-in protectionist policies? Sure, but I don't think Argentina did that. I don't think they did a full-on, like, fucking... Well, they did to an extent, right? Because we just read the little wiki blurb right there, where it said they try to focus more on, like, internal industrial development. I don't think they did it to the same extent, though. I mean, I guess we'll see. On the 18th of September, 1945, he delivered an address billed as From Work to Home, From Home to Work. The speech, prefaced by an excor excoriation of the conservative opposition, provoked an ovation by declaring that, quote, We've passed social reforms to make Argentine people proud to live where they live once again. This move fed growing rivalries against Perón, and on the 9th of October, he was forced to resign by opponents within the armed forces. Arrested four days later, he was released due to mass demonstrations organized by the CGT and other supporters. The 17th of October was later commemorated as Loyalty Day. His paramour, Eva Duarte, became hugely popular after helping organize the demonstration. Known as Evita, she helped Perón gain labor, uh, support with labor and women's groups. She and Perón were married on the 22nd of October. They married, like, right after he got out of prison? That's so cute. She saved his ass. That's super cute. God damn. I mean, they did, they did say that she was a celebrity, right? Like a minor celebrity? Holy shit, the mystery! Eva's 1951 biography, La Razón de Mi Vida, contains no dates or references to childhood occurrences and does not list the location of her birth or her name at birth. <laughs> All right. Playing it secret. CIA agent. No, this is like one of those girls that sees criminals in prison and say, I can fix him. Let's be fair. Pretty much all women are like that. The only women who aren't like that are the ones who would see a girl in prison and say, I can fix her. You know? Just a kind of gender-based brain damage. Vosh, is scrolling through your Wikip uh, through a Wikipedia article your idea of research? Uh, yes. Um, you can expand on that by going into further sources. But yeah, reading a Wiki article on basically any subject will tell you more about that subject than like, 99.9% .9 of people have like it, it, you know it's it's it, it'll give you a lot more info than most people have to be sure now depending on the specificity of the subject you will want to go into more like direct detail for instance if you want to learn more about the history of peronism that's definitely something or sorry peronism that's definitely something that you could like do a wiki article rundown for maybe like you know like a couple of blurbs or like uh you know secondary sources where people cover existing information that's fine that's okay unless you want to be like a scholar on it, you know, if you want to go into something really specific and detailed, for example, like maybe you want to do research on the effects that worker democracies have on capitalist economies. Well, you can read the Wikipedia section on that. But for that one, I would recommend del delving into the data. You know, I have a whole research document. I've gone over plenty of um, like academic articles on subjects like um, wealth inequality, the effect of immigration on domestic wages, uh, you know, um, transgender issues and ideology, uh, stuff like that, you know. It really depends on what you're trying to learn, but it almost always starts with superficial research, and that means, usually, Wikipedia articles. Because, like, yeah, that's what Wikipedia is for. Wikipedia is a modern marvel. It is, like, the last major non-commercialized site where you are provided essentially infinite information um, for nothing. It's like, a, it's like a marvel of the world, and it's running out of money. It's, it's running out of money. I donated. If you can donate to Wikipedia, I recommend that you do. Um, because, like, I really do not want them to be declare bankruptcy and be bought up by someone else. Honestly, they should be nationalized. Like, the, the resources for Wikipedia's running should be provided by the state. It's ridiculous that they have to beg for money when they provide so many people so much good. It's, it's honestly a great example of, like, the irrationality of allocating resources based on, on on spending, because Wikipedia is like a bedrock of modern civilization, but nobody wants to pay for it, you know? I heard Wikipedia isn't actually running out of money. I'm sure they're not, like, running out on a day-to-day -day basis, but I do believe them when they say they need money. I mean, Wikipedia should have, like, it, 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 they need enough money in the bank to, like, you know, hold down the fort during rough times. Peron's candidacy on the Labour Party ticket announced... Uh, the day after the 17th of October, 1945 mobilization. A lot of server upkeep. Wikipedia costs a lot of money to maintain. Became a lightning rod that rallied a unusually diverse opposition against it. Uh, the majority of the centrist Radical Civic Union, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, and most of the conservative National Autonomous Party 
had already been forged into a fractious alliance in June by interest in the financial sector in the Chamber of Commerce. Wait, really? The socialist and communist parties were mobilized by interests in the financial sector and the Chamber of Commerce, united solely by the goal of keeping Perón from the Casa Rosada. Why? What were you doing? They followed the political line of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The PCA organized the sending of volunteers to the international brigades and other resources to the Second Spanish Republic during the Spanish Civil War. Victorio Cordovia, who led the PCA's 8th Congress in 1928, advised the Communist Party of Spain on behalf of the Comintern during this period. He was also responsible for organizing local NKVD agents in Spain and directing the persecution, torture, and murder of militant anarchists. Great! F***ing great! I f***ing love communists, dude. They're so f***ing good, man. Definitely not just f***ing fascists. Every single f***ing time, dude. Every single f***ing time. Jesus f***ing Christ. For example, Cotovia was responsible for organizing the murder of Leon Trotsky. Wait, this was the guy? The murder of Leon Trotsky was organized by the f***ing Argentine Communist Party leader? Th that guy? Well, it's not like I give a f*** about Trotsky. Um, he was just as bad as, um, as, uh, Stalin. I thought he was killed in Mexico. I mean, he was. Listen, okay? Love communism. Communists. Every single f***ing time. Worst people in the world. Jesus Christ. Every single time. It's like I say, you go on Twitter, and if somebody in their bio has socialist, that means they're a socialist. If they have communist, that means they're a fascist, and they think that Putin is leading like a worker's vanguard against global capitalism. So no surprise why they organized against Piron. What about the Socialist Party? Ah, uh, this split with the Communist Party, okay. Doesn't even say much about their shit. Whatever. Maybe that says something about communism itself? Yeah, it needs better, uh, f***ing advocates. Anyway, organizing a massive kickoff rally in front of Congress on the 8th of December, the Democratic Union nominated Jose Tamburini and Enrique Mosca, two prominent UCR congressmen. Never forget, okay? The greatest, the greatest, um, blow to global communism was not the fall of the USSR, but its creation, all right? The USSR was never communist, its leaders never believed in communism, they never wanted communism, vanguardism is completely incompatible with communism, Marxism-Leninism is fake, it's just fascism, Marxism would have um, uh, uh, denounced it, it's not real, it's fake. It's just another way of creating an authoritarian government. The alliance failed to win over several prominent lawmakers such as Congressman Ricardo Balbin and Arturo Frondizi, and former uh, Cordoba Governor Amadio Sabatini, all of whom oppose, uh, nailing it with these names, all, all of whom oppose the union's ties to conservative interest. In a bid to support their campaign, U.S. Ambassador Spria Braden, Braden published a white paper, uh-oh, otherwise known as the Blue Book, and that's two different colors, accusing Perón, President Farrell, and others of fascist ties. Fluent in Spanish, Braden addressed dem uh, Democratic Union rallies in person, but his move backfired when Perón summar summarized the election as a choice between Perón or... Braden. He also rallied further support by responding to the Blue Book with his own Blue and White Book, which was a play on the Argentine flag colors and focused on the antagonism of Yankee imperialism. Yes! <laughs> Absolutely! He persuaded the president to sign the nationalization of the central bank and the extension of mandatory Christmas bonuses, actions that contributed to his decisive victory. Perón and his running mate, Hortensio um, Crijano, uh, Quijano leveraged popular support to victory over a radical civic union led opposition alliance by about 11% in the 46 elections. God damn. When Perón became president on the 4th of June, 1946, his two stated goals were social justice, woke, and economic independence. These two goals avoided Cold War entanglements from choosing between capitalism and socialism, but he had no concrete means to achieve those goals. Perón instructed his economic advisors to develop a five-year plan, oh, that sounds pretty communist, uh, with the goals of increasing workers' pay, achieving full employment, stimulating industrial growth of over 40% while diversifying the sector, then dominated by food processing, and greatly improving transportation, communication, energy, and social infrastructure in the private as well as public sectors. Okay. Uh, as, as a set of, like, initial policies, this seems pretty good. This guy will just say anything to get stronger. Well, Perón hasn't done or said anything inconsistent yet. So far, all of his goals seem pretty consistent. So, you know, I mean, we'll see how this fuck up, I guess. But, <clears throat> I mean, pretty base so far. Why is it always five years? 
Uh, it's just satisfying. Uh, Bolshevik Y2K, so far, yes. I mean, we'll see how it goes. Peron's planning prominently included political considerations. That's hard to say quickly. Numerous military allies were fielded as candidates, notably Colonel Domingo Mercante, who, when elected governor of the Paramount province of Buenos Aires, became renowned for his housing program. Having brought him to power, the General Confederation of Labor was given overwhelming support by the new administration, which introduced labor courts and filled its cabinet with labor union appointees, such as Juan Atilio Bramuglia of the Foreign Ministry and Angel Borlenghi of the Interior Ministry, which in Argentina oversees law enforcement. I really don't like the idea of the Ministry of the Interior also managing law enforcement. I don't I don't like that at all. I don't that's that's not a, a lot of nations do that. Really? In the United States, there isn't really that much federal oversight when it comes to law enforcement. It's lo it's usually like highly federalized and done locally. Is that true? That's super common. Mm, okay, I don't like that. <laughs> A lot of nations do that, and it's bad. Okay, I, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I don't, mm, I don't like that. Do you think policing should be nationalized? No, no. Yeah, and look how terrible our law enforcement is. Yeah, I don't know. I mm, may, maybe I could be moved on this. Maybe I do think it'd be better for policing to be managed by that. No, I don't. Mm. I guess the problem is, is that police have a fascist element to them, whether or not they're like local or federally controlled. The FBI are literally federal police? Well, well yeah. But, uh, sorry, does the Interior Ministry just manage, like, a small, separate federal police thing? Or uh, with all the local police still kept local? Like, I'm not saying there aren't American federal police, but also our Department of the Interior doesn't run the FBI. But, yeah, it, you know. It is worth noting, though, that the FBI, um, for all their faults, are less like... If you could, like, distill the amount of Hitler particles in any given FBI agent, I think it would be less than the number in any given police officer. So, meh. I, I don't know. Like, feds are really bad, but local cops are really bad, too. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's complicated. Maybe I could be moved on that. Maybe, maybe it would be better for us to have, like, way more federal control of police. I'm not sure. It also made room for amenable wealthy industrialists, like Central Bank... President Miguel Miranda, and socialists such as José Figueroa, a Spanish economist who had years earlier advised the nation's ill-fated regime of Miguel Primo de Rivera's. Intervention of their behalf by Perón's appointees encouraged the CGT to call strikes in the face of employers reluctant to grant benefits or honor new labor legislation. Strike activity, with half a million working days lost in 45, leapt to 2 million in 46 and over 3 million in 47, Holy shit, literally like federally encouraged striking, holy f***ing based. Helping rest needed labor reforms, though permanently aligning large employers against the Peronists. See, that's the pro that's the problem. That's the fuck problem, isn't it, you know? Uh, you do shit like this, you align business interests against you every single time. There's no way to keep business interests on your side while also being super duper pro, um... Worker. Labor unions grew in ranks from around half a million to over two million by 1950, primarily in the CGT, which has since been Argentina's paramount labor union. As the country's labor force numbered around five million people at the time, the Argentina's labor force was the most unionized in South America. God damn. Are you saying they shouldn't do that or they need to do more to counter the capitalists? They need to do more to counter the capitalists. You, you you can't, like, nicely and... It, there's no way to be, like, a pro-labor leader in a way that doesn't uh, make enemies of the business class. So you need to deal with the business class. You need to weaken them politically uh, so that they can't, like, turn against you. For all of their faults, this is something that China has done correctly. Um, the Chinese government is fascist. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm not saying that they're, like, good for labor rights or whatever. However, the Chinese government has done a pretty good job of like re like reining in uh, corporations that act against national interest. Unfortunately, their national interest is not the well-being of their working class. If it was, they'd be based, but they're not. So, Vosh, is he chaotically moral morally neutral? Um, guys, so far Peron has pretty much only done good things. I'm sure we're gonna lead we're gonna read more bad stuff in the future, but right now it seems like he was an incredibly effective and intelligent like agent of labor rights, you know? I know it'll go downhill, but like so far, this is pretty good. Wasn't he a dictator though? No, he was elected. 
I mean, he was part of like a secret military coup group, but it seems like basically everyone in government at the time was either doing a coup or part of the next coup. So yeah, all the cool kids were doing it. He was originally elected. Yeah, like I said, we're getting to it. Like, like, like I'm saying so far and people are chatting like, okay, well, what about stuff that happened in the future? I don't know. You're watching me read this. Just so you know, it gets ugly later on. I know. It's, it's okay. During the first half of the 20th century, a widening gap has uh, had existed. Uh, between the classes, Peron helped to close it through the increases of wages and employment, making the nation more pluralistic and less reliant on foreign trade. Before taking office in 46, Peron took dramatic steps which he believed would result in a more economically independent Argentina, better insulated from events such as World War II. He thought there would be another international war. He was right. The reduced availability of imports and the war's beneficial effects in both the quantity and price of Argentine exports had combined to create a 1.7 billion USD surplus during those years. Ah, damn. In his first two years in office, Peron nationalized the central bank, based, and paid off its billion-dollar debt to the Bank of England, based, nationalized the railways, based, mostly owned by British and French companies. Holy shit, how f***ing huge do your balls have to be to nationalize railways owned by the British and the French back in 1946 or whatever? Oh my god. Yeah, we're yoink! Like, Castro did this, and it led to, like, a 70-year blood debt from America, you know? Merchant, marine, universities, public utilities, public transport, then mostly tramways, and most significantly, created a single purchaser for the nation's mostly export-oriented grains and oil seeds, the Institute for the Promotion of Trade. Single purchaser for the nation's mostly export-oriented grains and oil seeds. Wait, so they could export it themselves or so they could distribute it internally? The IAPI wrested control of Argentina's famed grain ex export sector from entrenched conglomerates such as Bunge y Born, Bunge y Born? But when commodity prices fell after 1948, it began shortchanging growers. Uh-oh. IAPI profits were used to fund welfare projects, while internal demand was encouraged by large weight increases in the workers. Average real wages rose by about 35% from 45 to 49, while during that same period, labor's share of national income rose from 40% to 49%. Okay. Access to health care was made a universal right by the Workers' Bill of Rights enacted on the 24th of February, 1947, subsequently incorporated into the 1949 Constitution, while Social Security was extended to virtually all members of the Argentine working class. From 46 to 51, the number of Argentinians covered by Social Security more than tripled, so that in 51, more than 5 million people, 70% of the economically active population, were covered by Social Security. Health insurance also spread to new industries, including banking and metalworking. Between 59 and 49, real wages went up 22%, fell between 49 and 52, then increased again from 53 to 55, ending up at least 30% higher than in 46. In proportional terms, wages rose from 41% of national income to 49%. The boost in the real incomes of workers was encouraged by government policies, such as the enforcement of minimum wage laws, controls on the price of food, and other basic consumption items that extended housing credits to workers. Whoo! Okay, this is like a colossal list of dubs right here. This is, this is like, this is like all-time world fame shit right here. It, it, like this first term, 46 to 52 domestic policy. That is a that is a powerful lineup of of dubs, you know. Foreign policy and adversaries. Peron first articulated his foreign policy the third way in forty nine. <laughs> okay, this policy was developed to avoid the binary Cold War divisions and keep other world powers, such as the United States and Soviet Union, as allies rather than enemies. He restored diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union, severed since the Bolshevik Revolution in seventeen, and opened grain sales to the shortage stricken Soviets. Huh. Like, historically, like, the original wave of third positionism was fascists going, hey, what if there was an alternative to either liberal democracy or communism? And now he's doing the, what if there was an alternative to communism or liberal democracy, but it's social democracy this time? Shouldn't it be the fourth way because he's rejecting fascism as well? Yeah, that's also a euphemism for fascist uh, in, in Western politics, Lavdi. U.S. policy restricted Argentine growth during the Peron years by placing embargoes on Argentina. Man, I sure do love the United States f***ing up everything good that's ever happened in Latin America. The U.S. hoped to discourage the nation in its pursuit of becoming economically sovereign during a time when the world was divided into influence spheres. Yep. Sorry. 
you're in Latin America and it's the Cold War. It's time for America to f everything up. U.S. interests feared losing their stake as they had large commercial investments vested in Argentina through the oil and meat packing industries, besides being a mechanical goods provider to Argentina. His ability to effectively deal with points of contention abroad was equally hampered by Perón's own mistrust of potential rivals, which harmed foreign relations with Juan Atilio Bra Bramuglia's 1949 dismissal. Argentine labor lawyer who served as Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay, I remember this guy. The rising influence of American diplomat George F. Kennan, a staunch anti-communist and champion of containment, fed U.S. suspicions that Argentine goals for economic sovereignty and neutrality were Perón's disguise for a resurgence of communism in the Americas. Let's go, USA! The U.S. Congress took a, uh, took a dislike to Perón and his government. In 1948, they excluded Argentine exports from the Marshall Plan and the trademark uh, sorry, the landmark Truman administration effort to combat communism and help rebuild war-torn European nations by offering U.S. aid. This contributed to Argentine financial crises after 48, and according to Perón biographer Joseph Page, the Marshall Plan drove a final nail into the coffin that bore Perón's ambitions to transform Argentina into industrial power. The policy deprived Argentina of potential agricultural markets in Western Europe to the benefit of Canadian exporters, for example. Nice, 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 nice. As efforts with the U.S. deteriorated, Perón made efforts to mitigate the misunderstandings, which were made easier after President Harry Truman replaced the hostile Braden with Ambassador George Messersmith. Perón negotiated the release of Argentine assets in the U.S. in exchange for uh, preferential treatment for U.S. goods, followed by Argentine ratification of the Act of Chapultepec, uh, no, Chapultepec, a centerpiece of Truman's Latin America policy. He even proposed the enlistment of Argentine troops in the Korean War in 1950 under UN auspices, a move retracted in the face of public opposition. Perón was opposed to borrowing from foreign credit markets, preferring to float bonds domestically. He refused to enter the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, a precursor to the World Trade Organization or the International Monetary Fund. We stand a principled mother. Believing that international sports created goodwill, however, Perón hosted the 1950 World Basketball Championship and 1951 Pan American Games, both of which Argentine athletes won resoundingly. Ooh, sorry, international sports only create goodwill if the other team wins. If you f***ing dunk on them, literally, uh, it, it doesn't do that, actually. He also sponsored numerous notable athletes, including five-time Formula One world champion Juan Manuel Fangio, who, without this funding, would have most likely never competed in Europe. Perón's bid to host the 56th Summer Olympics in Buenos Aires was defeated by the International Olympic Committee by one vote. Economic success was short-lived. Following a recovery period from 33 to 45, from 46 to 43, Argentina gained benefits from Perón's five-year plans. The GDP expanded by over a fourth during that brief boom, about as much as it had during the previous decade. Using roughly half of the U.S. $1.7 billion in reserves inherited from wartime surplus for nationalizations, economic development agencies de devoted most of the other half to finance both public and private investment. The roughly 70% jump in domestic fixed investment was accounted for mostly by industrial growth in the private sector. All this much-needed activity exposed an intrinsic weakness in the plan. It subsidized growth, which, in the short term, led to a wave of imports of the capital goods that local industry could not supply. Whereas the end of World War II had allowed Argentine exports to rise from 700 million U.S. to 1.6 billion U.S., Perón's changes led to skyrocketing imports from U.S. 300 million to U.S. 1.6 billion and erased the surplus. Yeah, this, so this is... This is a consistent issue. Um, if you want to be independent, it's you have to be really careful about your development on your reliance on industrial development that you can't supply the materials for, like locally. You know, you have to be really, really careful about that because if the rest of the world cuts you off, uh, you you kind of lose the ability to, um, you know, like like stimulate that growth. I guess he did try to move development from the agricultural sector over to the industrial sector. So maybe there were efforts undertaken to address that, but hmm, yeah, that's really tough. Perón's bid for economic independence was further complicated by a number of inherited external factors. Great Britain owed Argentina around 150 million pounds sterling, nearly 650 USD, or sorry, 650 million USD from agricultural imports to that nation during the war. The debt was mostly in the form of Argentine central bank reserves, 
uh, were deposited in the Bank of England. The money was useless to the Argentine government because the treaty allowed the Bank of England to hold the funds in trust, something British planners cannot compromise on as a result of the country's debts to the Oil Lease Act. Okay. The nation's need for U.S.-made capital goods increased. Man, how little things change, huh? Remember how uh, 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 desperate um, Millet is for foreign investment? Though ongoing limits to the central bank's availability of hard currency hampered access to them. Argentina's pound sterling surpluses. Okay, this is more complicated economic stuff. Hold on. Government accepted the transfer of over 24,000 kilometers of British-owned railways in exchange for the debt in March 48. The political distrust between U.S. and the government. Argentine foreign exchange earnings via its exports U.S. fell, turning a 100 million USD surplus to the United States into a 300 million deficit. The combined pressure practically devoured Argentina's liquid reserves, and uh, Miranda issued a temporary restriction on the outflow of dollars to U.S. banks. The nationalization of the Port of Buenos Aires and domestic and foreign on private cargo ships, as well as the purchase of others, nearly tripled the national merchant marine ship to 1.2 million tons of displacement, reduced the need for over 100 million dollars in U.S. shipping fees, and I just the deficit. Exports fell sharply, due in part to a deterioration in terms of trade of about a third. The central bank was forced to devalue the peso at an unprecedented rate. The peso lost around 70% of its value from early 1948 to early 1950, leading to a decline in the imports, fueling industrial growth and recession. Dude, it is so fucking cool how nothing good is possible unless you're like America or a few countries that aren't America. Because if you ever try to do anything good, the entire world is like, yeah, I don't know. That sounds like communism, and it sounds like we're not going to be able to invest. So yeah, we're not going to play ball with you anymore. And then everything fucking dies. This is why protectionism is not good. Well, no, this isn't even protectionism. Not really. Um, the problem here is that Argentina was too reliant on other countries. Like, if anything, they should have been more protectionist. Um, maybe the best ways. Maybe the best way to avoid this would have been to restructure the Argentine economy in such a way where he would have had much uh, slower d domestic growth, but he could have relied entirely on like locally sourced resources. I another big issue is that at this time, Argentina didn't really have many allies locally, right? Was Ar Argent, like, cause the rest of Latin America wasn't exactly doing great. I mean, Chile, Brazil, it, 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 it's not like they could have like developed a, a fucking local trading group or whatever to their own interest. America was cooing shit left and right during this time in Latin America. But the more you close off your economy and the more protectionist you get, the more likely America is to kill your fucking leaders. So yeah. Should he have been slower with his changes? It seems to me like it would have been a good idea to dial things a little bit more slowly when it comes to international investment and also to... um develop things domestically in a way that could be uh, sort of supported and supplemented and managed by local industry rather than, I mean, a big part of it is staying on good terms with the USA, frankly, like that is a huge part of it, you know? Yeah, exactly, Bolshevik Y2K. Like it, it, it is almost impossible to develop as like an independent protectionist nation that is strong and stable if the United States is actively opposing your development. It's not impossible, I'm sure. It's just really difficult. How would you get the U.S. on their side? Uh, um, I don't know if there's anything you could do to get the U.S. on their side. It might be impossible. However, my here's an idea. Okay, here, here's an idea. All right. Um, aggressively cultivate the interests. No, hmm. promote pro labor action, but don't reshuffle your economy in a way that completely reduces your dependency on foreign markets. Instead, try to become a net exporter by developing a local industrial sector that can supplement your needs for imports while exporting in this case large amounts of what what is it they exported like oil meat agricultural stuff grain you know focus on that and continue selling it at a global on a global market at a low price and supplement the low price by using the federal government's reserves to pay the workers so they meet par with the rest of the um the country's wages that way, the rest of the world can still benefit from like cheap um, uh, 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 Argentine exports, but domestically, the working base can become stronger because they're being supplemented by wages paid out by the state, which it seems like he was already doing to an extent. 
if you do that and you develop slowly to a point where you're able to build up a sort of local industrial sector that allows you to develop without relying on imports, maybe you could structure things as a bit more of an economic power. The big issue is that if you no longer export as much, if you reduce your exports, other countries no longer have a strong incentive to play by your terms, right? If Argentina reduces all of the exports that other countries relied on them for, then like, what's the point in, in getting along with them? You've, you, they're not relying on you for anything anymore, right? There's no, like, there's no more leverage. So what you want to do is make sure other countries continue to rely on your cheap exports, but do so in a way that allows you to slowly dial up the pressure to, to be treated more as like, uh, like, uh, Canada as an exporter in terms of like, uh, agricultural goods or America, you know, a country that can fight on, on level playing field, uh, rather than like, you know, it's just some Latin American country that you could sort of extort resources from. And over time, maybe you could sort of like leverage that into a position of stability. But even then, even then, I don't know. So become Taiwan. Well, Taiwan did do a lot of good economically. That's sure. Uh, that's, that's for sure. Wouldn't the U.S. still kick in the door if they felt that protectionism would prevent foreign investment? Well, what I'm describing isn't really protectionism. It's a kind of like there are elements of protectionism that they're advocating for, but if the U.S. is antagonistic to protectionist elements of your government, you have to try to dial things in a way that prevents you from getting f***ing murdered, right? Would you say these are similar circumstances here with regards to, like, Thomas Sankara? Well, the, the shit Thomas Sankara went through is basically what every country outside of the, the Western hegemon goes through, you know? Like... Thomas Sankara was just dealing with it from the lowest end of the economic spectrum, but it's the same basic issue all around the world. Uh, the West does not want you to develop locally. They want you to be dependent on them. That's just my guess, though, you know? <clears throat> it's possible nothing could have been done. It's, it's entirely possible, and I hate to say it, that in Latin America during the 1950s, you maybe just had to play ball and be like a simp for America, at least to some extent, because the alternative might just be like they starve your country or kill you. Like it, it might be that simple. Like it, it's possible that early Cold War America from like 19, like, uh, like 1950s to like, you know, at least like the late 70s, it might be that is just not a time period during which you can develop labor in, in like a meaningful way globally, right? Like, the, like not saying it's good, just like it, there might just be a sort of Damocles hanging over your head where the only way to like resist that is to, to join with the Soviet Union. And what happens to Soviet Union sympathizers or even people who act like them in Latin America during the Cold War, right? They get killed so you know do we know of any coups the ussr did or tried oh yeah they did plenty the ussr was willing to provide a lot of money and a lot of resources to countries that said they were on their side they were very um naive with the people they supported like they gave money to saddam hussein because saddam hussein was like yeah i'm a socialist actually um but no the ussr killed and cooed a lot of people i mean the invasion of afghanistan being a pretty clear example hungary yeah all right Short of central bank reserves, Peron was forced to borrow $125 million from the U.S. Export-Import Bank to cover a number of private banks' debts to U.S. institutions, w uh, without which their insolvency would have become a central bank liability. Austerity and better harvest in 1950 helped fi uh, finance a recovery in 51, but inflation, having risen from 13% to 31% in 49, reached 50% in late 51 before stabilizing, and a second sharper recession soon followed. Workers' purchasing power by 52 had declined 20% from its 48 high, and GDP, having leapt by a fourth during Peron's first two years, saw zero growth from 48 to 52. The U.S. economy, by contrast, grew by around a fourth in the same interim. Yeah, because the U.S. was having a post-war economic boom, getting to trade with all their European buddies, whereas Argentina got locked out of that market because they were worried that Argentina was being communist or something. After 52, however, wages began rising in real terms once more. The increasing frequency of strikes increasingly directed against Perón as the economy slid into stagflation in late 54 was dealt with through the expulsion of organizers from the CGT ranks. To consolidate his political grasp on the eve of colder economic winds, Perón called for a broad constitutional reform in September. The elected convention, whose opposition members soon resigned, approved the wholesale replacement of the 83, or sorry, uh, 1853 Constitution of Argentina with a new Magna Carta in March, explicitly guaranteeing social reforms, but also allowing the mass nationalization of natural resources and public services, as well as the re-election of the president. Allowing the re-election of the president? Did Argentina previously have one-term presidencies? Like, it, it doesn't say mandate the re-election. It says allow the... It did? 
Interesting. I've never heard of a one-term presidency. That's kind of weird. I don't like that. You should have at least two terms. Mexico is like that. That's weird to me. Otherwise, what's the difference between having a good leader and a bad leader? Like, there's no difference, right? Like, you have a bad leader. Oh, they have six years. You have a good leader. Like, oh, they have six years. Made record investments in Argentina's infrastructure. Invested over $100 million to modernize the railways. He nationalized a number of small regional air carriers, forcing them into... Aerolíneas Argentinas in 1950, the airline, equipped with 36 new DC-3 and 4 aircraft, was supplemented with a new international airport and a 22-kilometer freeway into Buenos Aires. This freeway was followed by one in Rosario and Santa Fe. Perón had mixed success in expanding the country's inadequate electrical grid, which grew by only one-fourth during his tenure. He installed hydroelectric capacity, which leapt from 45 to 350 megawatts during his first term, about a fifth of the total public grid. He promoted the fossil fuel industry by ordering these resources nationalized, inaugurating Rio Turbio, uh, Argentina's only active coal mine, having natural gas flared by the state and completion of a gas pipeline. The pipeline was at the time the longest in the world. Oil production rose, but since most manufacturing was powered by on-site generators and the number of motor vehicles grew by a third, the need for oil ex imports, ooh, okay, that's a big issue. Since most manufacturing was powered by on-site generators, that means the electrical grid isn't well-developed. Like, that means that if you wanted to do something out there, like you needed a f***ing generator that you're refilling with gasoline or whatever, as opposed to just, like, connecting it to a power grid. Um, that, that's indicative of, like, infrastructural issues. Maybe it would have been a better idea to dial back on some of the, like, highway stuff. Well, mm, no, highways are pretty important at this point in development. I don't know. H hindsight's 2020. This was during like the 1940s and 50s. They didn't know much about traffic at the time. Peronism's government remembered for its record social investments. He introduced a Ministry of Health to the cabinet. Artemy, how do you feel about Peronism's legacy in Argentina? He's purring so hard. He introduced a Ministry of Health to the cabinet. Its first head, the neurologist Ramon Carrillo, oversaw the completion of over 4,200 healthcare facilities. Holy shit. Related works included construction of more than 1,000 kindergartens and over 8,000 schools, including several hundred technological nursing and teacher schools, among an array of other public investments. Dude, it really seems like the big mistake that Perón made was angering the U.S. That's so annoying. <laughs> Uh, he, so much of this would would have worked if they had not been kicked out of the global market and like frozen, you know, with with international relations. Like a lot of this would have gone so much better. You just you got to run slower, you know. I guess the Minister of Public Works oversaw the construction of six hundred fifty thousand new public sector homes, as well as of the international airport, one of the largest in the time. Yeah, Buenos Aires Airport is still really like famous for how big it is, right? The reactivation of the dormant National Mortgage Bank spurred private sector housing development, averaging over eight units per 1,000 inhabitants. The pace was, at the time, on par with that of the United States and one of the highest rates of residential construction in the world. He modernized the armed forces, especially its air force, manufactured two advanced jet aircraft. See, their local, dom their, their domestic industrial production couldn't have possibly been that bad if they were making their own jet aircraft. Do you have any idea how hard this is like it's not like they were importing every gear and cog from the united states they had to have a pretty strong like regional base uh, they did a paperclip operation though like they brought nazis over to do their engineering to be fair so did everyone america did the soviets did everyone did the when, when germany was defeated everyone's first thought was like yep we're taking those engineers we're that shit is ours and everyone fought over them you know yoink Let's not let a, a good mind go to waste. You know, we're, we're all going to do f***ing Dr. Strangelove shit, okay? Why were the Germans so good at uh, rockets and jets? Uh, before the uh, Nazi regime really took off, uh, Berlin was just already uh, one of the world, uh, uh, one of the, like, landmark sites for, for academia, engineering, and education. Like, that, they, it was, Berlin was already positioned to be full of, you know, uh, genius uh, invent. Now, the problem for the Nazis is that a lot of their genius inventors and scientists and stuff were Jewish, so a lot of them had to flee, and that's why we got a bomb before them. <laughs> you know, 
if they had kept Einstein, dude. Yeah, no, literally. Like the it's because pe people are like, oh, it's like genius German engineering. If they were geniuses, they probably wouldn't have kicked out all of the like German Jews and international, uh, you know, students who ended up helping us out. It's not like America wasn't also building sick shit during the war. We just decided to yoink their engineers too. And so did the USSR. Praise hands and competent fascists. Yep, every time. Every time. And the French engineer Emile de, Wonne, de Wotine condemned in France in, absen in absentia for collaborationism. The French engineer was condemned in France for collaborationism? So wait, were they French or German? Oh, I see. After the successful invasion of France by Germany in 40, culminated armistice to Germany, creation of the Vichy government, de Wontin briefly tried to start a business in the U.S. This caused him to be tried for treason under the Vichy government. He went back to work with SIPA, which after an agreement with the Vichy government and the Vichy? 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 That sounds Italian, not French. Vichy. Uh, manufacturing trainer aircraft intended for the Luftwaffe. So he was kind of press ganged into it, maybe? I'm not sure. Uh, different thing, different thing. I'm not sure. Whatever. Don't work with Nazis. Made their own planes. Piron announced in 51 the uh, Huimul project would produce nuclear fusion before any country. That's ambitious. The project was led by an Austrian, Ronald Richter. Hmm. Worked in Germany with Professor Max Steinbeck and Professor Manfred von Arden on a particle accelerator, which after the war, the Soviets copied and coined the term Tokamak. In preparation for his dissertation for a doctorate from the University of Prague. Okay, this is exactly what I mean, dude. Like, there were so many smart people working in Germany and Austria beforehand, and the, the Nazis just showed up, you know? They're not, they're, so it seems like he just continued his research during World War II? Like how much of this was like specifically weapons development for the for the uh, for the Germans? They don't mention infamous in connection infamous in connection with the Argentine Humor project. Wait, hold on. What happens? Peron announced that energy produced by fusion process would be delivered in milk bottle sized containers. What is blood waffling about? What fusion energy de de delivered to your home in milk bottle sized like the milkman like bringing you like batteries? Richter announced success in 51, but no proof was given. The next year, Perón appointed a scientific team to investigate Richter's activities. Reports by Jose Antonio Abacero and Mario Bencora revealed the project was a fraud. Ah, many such cases. A lot of shit like this was happening during this time. After this human project was transferred to the Centro Atomico Bar Bariloche, Bariloche, the new National Atomic Energy Commission, the Physics Institute of the recently aired History Channel documentary, the secrecy, Nazi connections, declassified U.S. intel documents and military infrastructure located around the road facility all argue for the more likely objective of atomic bomb development. The Argentine Navy actually bombed multiple buildings in 55, an unusual method of decommissioning a legitimate... What? Wait, they had a, a, a nuclear weapons program and then to cover it up, they had the Navy bomb the the facility an unusual method of decommissioning a legitimate research facility can you imagine an alternative universe where uh fucking argentina became like the only country to independently develop nuclear weapons with no cross research from the ussr or the us and then ended up like well not the only i shouldn't say the only but they would have been the earliest right i think uh india did as well but they would have been the earliest um and then they became like the weird like local Latin American nuclear hegemon or whatever. That would have protected them from the United States. Sounds like something from Team Fortress 2 lore. Yeah. Is that the good timeline or the bad timeline? I'm going to fucking say it. I wish Latin America had nukes in the 50s. F America, dude. Holy shit. Maybe that would have kept our hands off that fucking continent, dude. Oh my God. Yeah. Do they have nukes now? Argentina? I'm pretty sure they don't. I don't even know if Brazil does. Argentina has eschewed nuclear weapons. Yeah, okay. Does Brazil have nukes? No, they do not. Does Chile have nukes? No. Okay, yeah. Latin America is nuke-free. How did Argentina not get nukes? They had the money in uranium. I think uh, building nukes is hard. Is my impression. Eva Perón's influence and contribution. Perón was instrumental as a symbol of hope of the common laborer during the five-year plan when she died in 52. This is what the world is missing that we need more of, okay? We need more beautiful women in power who become like pseudo 
angelic symbols of social progress. That's the thing we're really missing, okay? We need we need like uh just gorgeous uh uh uh, uh figures of hope um that that symbolically represent our movement forward, okay? That's what we need. Yeah, we need more Dolores Day shit. Absolutely. It's the only way forward for fucking moralism. This is every every public building. Just we we what I'm saying essentially, we need like a Joan of Arc. We need like a we need like an archangel of justice, okay? We need we need like a pseudo-mythical figure uh that we can all believe in. All right? That's what we need. Dude, the the actual official art of Dolores Day is so good. It's unbelievable how good the direction is for Disco Elysium. It actually like defies comprehension. Like they were truly some like divinely inspired shit that they were on when they made this entire game. Did you read the official art book? No, but I, I need to buy it. What do you think of Dolores Day as a figure, memes aside? I think that she is, as a person, the most scathing criticism you could possibly make of liberalism. For, for all the good and the bad. You know, coming from humble origins, she was loathed by the elite, but adored by the poor for her work with the sick, the elderly, and the orphans. Okay, so she's Jesus. Okay. It was due to her. I, dude, I fucking hate um, Mother Teresa. You actually read into Mother Teresa and she was a fucking piece of shit. I, it's because everyone's like, oh, they, she's like a lady who works with poor people and sick people. She's like, you know, she's it's like, no, she's sucked, you know? It was due to her behind-the-scenes work that women's suffrage was granted in 47, and a feminist wing of the third party in Argentina was formed. Simultaneous to Perón's five-year plans, Eva supported a women's movement that concentrated on the rights of women, the poor, and the disabled. Man, disability rights in the 40s. That's pretty impressive. Although her role in the politics of Perón's first term remained disputed, Eva introduced social justice and equality into the national discourse. She stated, It is not philanthropy, nor is it charity. It is not even social welfare. To me, it is strict justice. I do nothing but return to the poor what the rest of us owe them, because we had taken it away from them unjustly. I'm gonna end up being a f***ing Eva stan at the end of this. Holy shit. Fuck glowing eyes as she says this. Jesus f***ing Christ. In 48, she established the Eva Perón Foundation, which was perhaps the greatest contribution to her husband's social policy, enjoying an annual budget of around $50 million, about 1% of the GDP. That's insane! What is that? How much is that 1% of the US GDP would be in $230 billion a year? That's like a significant portion of our military budget. Eva Perón and Rosa Luxemburg were queens of the working class. Yeah, for sure. The foundation had 14,000 employees and founded hundreds of new schools, clinics, old age homes, and hospital facilities. It also distributed hundreds of thousands of household necessities, physicians' visits, and scholarships, among other benefits. Among the best known of the foundation's many large construction projects are the Evita City development south of Buenos Aires, 25,000 homes, and the Republic of the Children, a theme park based on tales from the Brothers Grimm. In what? Okay. Hell yeah, dude. The first theme park in the Americas? Not just Latin America, but all the Americas. Regarded as the first th Holy shit! Aw, oh, that's nice. In 2001, the Congress of Argentina declared the Children's Republic National Historical Monument. In 2008, the government of the province of Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires signed an agreement with the National University of General St. Martin for a general restoration that included the investigation and historic reconstruction of the buildings. Huh, that's nice. I mean, I'm glad people care. Aires? Aires, that's it. Aires. 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 Aires? Aires. Iris. Like an I. Aires. Aires. You're doing fine? Thank you. I'll probably f*** it up again. Following Peron's 1955 ousting, spoilers, 20 such construction projects were abandoned incomplete, and the Foundation's $290 million endowment was liquidated. Oh, I love that. I bet his ousting is going to be, like, really cool and not at all and incredibly detrimental for the people of Argentina. The portion of the five-year plans which argued for full employment, public health care and housing, labor benefits and raises were a result of Eva's influence in the policymaking of Perón in his first term. As historians note, he initially wanted to keep imperialists out of Argentina and create effective businesses. The humanitarian relief efforts embedded in the five-year plan were Eva's creation, which endeared the Peronist movement to the working-class people from which Eva had come. Her strong ties to the poor and her position as Perón's wife brought credibility to his promises during the first presidential term and ushering in a new wave of supporters. I have a lot of respect for um, power couples, you know? I really hate 
that like the first lady position in the US presidency, like it doesn't mean shit. You know, it's like you have the president, the most powerful man in the world, and then you have a lady who every once in a while gets given like half a million dollars to do some bullshit like national, you know, priority thing or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's it's like a symbolic position, you know. I I I wish there I want more power couples, you know. The first lady's willingness to replace the ailing Hortensio Quijano as Perón's running mate for the 1951 campaign was defeated by her own frail health and by military opposition. A 22nd of August rally organized for her by the CGT on Buenos Aires' wide Nueve de Julio Avenue failed to turn the tide. 20th of September, elements in the Argentine army led by General Benjamin Andres Menendez. Menendez. Menin. What, is a, what does an accent over the E mean? So it's like me and then nie? What, 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 is, what, is the, what, what would this mean pronunciation wise? Menendez? Stress? Menendez? Menendez? Just emphasis? Okay, just emphasis. So like Menendez. Is this all you're going to talk about? Pronunciation? No, we're talking about Peronism. Accents in Spanish just show where the emphasis is. Uh, where the emphasis. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Attempted a coup against Peron. That, so it's so that's why I say Peron and not Peron. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Although unsuccessful, the mutiny marked the end of the first lady's political hope. She died the following July. What the? Fuck? This guy's wives keep dying early. What the? Fuck? Damn. I, I I feel like if anything, I'm gonna come away from this like an Eva Peron stan because it seems like. Peron's legacy is kind of tainted a little bit by some failures, but she just was a queen the whole time. God damn. Look at that goddamn dress, too. Holy shit, slaying. She looked like a, a transfer. Oh, are you saying she's a little clocky, parentheses positive? I can see it. That would explain the, the social justice uh, interests. His heart is hardened by loss. That's the only character development that men get in stories. It's like a, a guy... A guy has feelings, but then because a, a, a woman died, he has different feelings. That's the way all male development takes place. Where the f*** is the waist in that painting? Yeah, I guess she's wearing like some very restrictive corset here. I mean, it makes sense given the outfit. What's the last photo of her? How? Oh, there's a photo of her in a coffin. I guess she, she had an open casket funeral. Serving even from beyond the grave. When 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 you put when you put me in a casket, okay, make sure that my face is arranged in a judgmental stare, so everyone can know that I'm still uh, I'm still still frowning at them, still styling on them on the way out. She's actually really cute. Okay, I, I should moving on. Opposition and repression. Here we go. The first to vocally oppose Perón's rule were the Argentine intelligentsia and the middle class. Oh, these every time these guys dude holy shit the um the the idea that we have of um of like academics and the intelligentsia being progressive is actually a relatively modern thing keep in mind that for like a billion years the only people who could get high level education were the ultra wealthy and their children like that that's not necessarily the case at this point in argentina but there was much more of a class character to being in college nowadays lots of people in college not most, but a lot of them are of like pretty ordinary economic backgrounds. But during the time, and you know, you go back further, like the intelligentsia in in um in Germany were like pro Nazi because we, if you take a look at like the class character of your average in Berlin professor, they're like some super snooty upper class wealthy person. They're not like some scruffy like you know nineteen sixties academic beatnik or whatever. You know these these people are like the upper crust. Um, and you know the middle class. These guys are always having terrible ideas. University students and professors were seen as particularly troublesome. Peron fired over two thousand university professors and faculty members from all major public education institutions. That's probably not good. These included Nobel laureate. You fired a Nobel laureate? Holy shit, the balls. Um, physiologist, uh, painter, uh, art scholars, and noted author Jorge Luis Borges, who at the time was head of the National Library of Buenos Aires. Noted author Jorge Luis Borges, who at the time was head of the National Library of Buenos Aires, was appointed poultry inspector at the Buenos Aires Municipal Wholesale Market, a post which he refused. Wait. Peron had that kind of power, he could be like, you are no longer head of the National Library. You are now poultry inspector. Is that, is that this is like Soviet shit. What? I, 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 I get firing a person from a national post, but you can do that? 
Peron was very authoritarian. Yeah, well, he's he's Argentinian uh, Huey Long. Does it not mention him being appointed poultry inspector? I really want to know more about the poultry inspection thing, is the thing. Ah, whatever. Why did Peron demote Borges? Well, I'm guessing because he was a, a, a opposition to the regime. Control F? I don't believe in Control F. It's cheating. You have to be able to find it yourself. The labor movement that had brought Peron to power was not exempt from the Iron Fist, and the 46 elections for the post of Secretary General of the CGT resulted in Telephone Workers Union leader Louis Gay's victory over Peron's nominee. Former retail workers leader Angel Berlengi, both central figures in Peron's famed 17 October comeback, there's Louis Gay, had him expelled and replaced with Jose Espejo, a little known rank and filer who was close to the First Lady. The Meat Packers union leader turned against Peron when he replaced the Labour Party with the Peronist Party in 1947. Organizing a strike in protest, Reyes was arrested on the charge of plotting against the lives of the President and the First Lady. Tortured in prison, Reyes was denied parole five years later and freed only after regime's 55 downfall. Mmm. I don't know, guys. I don't know. I'm starting to, starting to worry that uh, Peron may have been a little bit of an authoritarian, slightly. Hmm. Yeah, Huey Long wouldn't have had people tortured, you know? He would have just had, like, if if you if you displease Huey Long in a longest regime, you're not tortured or whatever. Uh, you just wake up one day to realize that every single one of your co-workers has the surname Long, and your, uh, you know, you, you, your, your HR department receives a number of complaints that you're not a good team member. Um, you, and from that day forward, <laughs> every... And every person you pass by in the street, every job application you file, some guy named Long, uh, <laughs> turns you down. Statism and authoritarianism go along? Sure, but everyone is a statist. Like, literally everyone right now. Even anarchists operate under the, like, like there, there is no escaping the state under the current, like, global political and economic paradigm. You know, a like, true abolition of the state politics. This is a very, very long way away. Um, currently it's it's unsustainable it's irrational to even like promote it frankly as like a current solution to anything uh and that's fine you know there's a lot of work to be done <laughs> my, my face when i'm in a huey competition but i'm a huey short i'm up against huey long yeah huey longer a status doesn't mean someone who wants to keep the state it means someone who worships the state i i, mm, I, I don't know I, that feels like not the definition that i use generally but as for a person who, the only people who like truly actively worship the state are fascists. And even then they, they deny it, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. Nobody wants to be seen worshiping the state you, they, you, to, to get unironic advocates for that kind of statism. You need to turn to like an Imperial Japan or whatever. You, you, people need to be well and truly lost for that, to, for that to be the case. I, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Cipriano Reyes was one of hundreds of Peron's opponents held at Buenos Aires Romos Mejia General Hospital, one of whose basements was converted into a police detention center where torture became routine. Okay. All right. The populist leader was intolerant of both left-wing and conservative opposition. Though he used violence, Peron preferred to deprive the opposition of their access to media. Interior Minister Borlengi administered El Laborista, the leading official news daily. Carlos Elo, uh, Eloy? The, a personal friend of Evita's, oversaw an array of leisure magazines published by Editorial Haynes, which the Peronist Party bought a majority stake in. Through the Secretary of the State, Raul Apold, socialist dailies such as La Vanguardia or Democracia, or conservative ones such as La Prensa or La Razón, were simply closed or expropriated in favor of the CGT or the ALEA, the regime's new state media company. Okay. I'm seeing some issues here. Intimidation of the press increased between 43 and 46. 110 publications were closed down. Well, wait, he wasn't even the leader in 43. You mean just like as the as a minister of labor under the previous party? Others such as La Nation and Roberto Nobel's... Nobles? Nobe, would, it'd be Nobles, right? Nobles Corinne became more cautious and self-censoring. Peron be, appeared more threatened by the dissident artists than by opposition political figures. And there's a intellectualist, so insects, a filmmaker, pianist actress how you how you banishing a pianist jesus christ an actress libertad lamarck victim of a rivalry with eva peron dude he's he's kicking bitches out because his his wife doesn't like him we love a wife guy fascist influence the relationship between peron peronism and fascism has been widely discussed okay i will say this peron definitionally 
cannot be a fascist. Fascism necessitates, among other things, uh, state hysteria against uh, an ethnic or religious or national in-group, out-group dynamic, and the suppression of labor rights. Uh, if you if you do if you aren't doing the suppression of labor rights thing, you're doing this like weird like national socialist uh, you know like um, d d d third positionist bullshit or whatever, and that doesn't tend to work in in long term. The right like the Nazbol stuff. He locked up opposing unions though. Yeah, but that's not him being anti workers' rights. That's him being anti opposition. I'm not getting a fascist vibe from him. I think I'm just getting an authoritarian vibe. I, I, I think like, I think this is probably a guy who learned a lot from his studies in Italy and Germany. He learned a lot about the failures of fascism, but also how it could be useful to him. He was part of a secret military group that ended up like assisting in a coup before becoming an authoritarian himself. It seems to me like he literally tried to do like the unironic third positionist thing where he was like, I have a new idea. What if we did this and this? And like, unlike a lot of third positionists, he actually meant it. The problem is a lot of the ideas he had were bad ones, but it seems to me like he was sincere. Like he sincerely believed in pro worker, you know, like pro labor causes or whatever. He's not like one of those um, phony populists who only pretends to care about labor rights, but then the moment he gets in power, he clamps down on them. It seems like the only thing he ever really clamped down on was opposition, which is just authoritarian business. So he's a rare, authentic third positionist. That is. That is incredibly interesting. Do you have any idea how unlikely that is? Do you do you have any idea how many people have claimed to be third positionists when in reality they're just regular fascists? Like they're they're not finding some like middle ground between capitalism and communism. They're just doing fascism or whatever. Like this guy actually did that and didn't seem to be a fascist. He was still an authoritarian though. I'm I'm guessing he probably learned a lot from the fascists, though. So it's not as though the influence wasn't there. It's just that wasn't his ideology. World's only real third positionist and only real authoritarian socialist. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of the so-called authoritarian socialists are just authoritarian. Stalin wasn't a socialist, you know? Maybe you... Um... I don't know. Wait, do you, do you think this guy's probably on the same level as, like, Castro? A person who did sincerely believe in workers' liberation, but was also fundamentally like an authoritarian, in part because he felt like things couldn't persist unless he was in charge. He may be in the same ballpark. Castro did a lot to improve the, the living standards of the working class in, 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 in Cuba. And he cared, too. He wasn't faking it. Like he was, Castro was not like a grifter or whatever. He clearly cared. It, it's just, you know... I just don't respect authoritarianism. What about Gaddafi? He was kind of a third positionist. No, Gaddafi didn't believe in anything. Gaddafi said whatever he needed to say at any point in time to appeal to whatever leaders he was trying to appeal to. Motherfucker had no beliefs apart from him being in power. You know? He's more like, um, Ataturk than Castro. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Ataturk? I don't know enough about his regime to really say. Ataturk? Oh, that's easier than I thought it would be. Okay. Look it up. Gaddafi was a rapist. Gaddafi was monstrous. Don't ever stand Gaddafi. If a person's ever like, um, did you know Gaddafi was like a pan-Africanist who was gonna... No, he wasn't! Dude worked with anyone and everyone. He would pal along with the West. He would pal along with dictators. He was a serial rapist. He had like personal slaves and like torture chamber. No, 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 no. Gaddafi didn't. G G if any, the the person most ideologically similar to Gaddafi would probably be Saddam Hussein in the region because Saddam Hussein was also somebody who variably alternated between pretending to be a socialist, pretending to be a pan Arabist, pretending to be like this, that, the other, but was fundamentally just evil and self serving. You know that was. Like, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the closest comparison. And I genuinely think that Saddam Hussein was probably a more competent leader than Gaddafi. I don't know who killed more. Well, Saddam Hussein definitely killed more people, but he was probably more competent in leadership. Can you really be said to be more competent if the thing you're competent at is killing people? I don't really know. Gaddafi was a wacky guy. Both were idiots. Yeah, we can work with that. Doesn't saying fascism is inherently anti-worker imply that early fascist Spain wasn't fascist? I mean, you could say it was inconsistently fascist, right? Like, capitalism, it sort of trends towards free markets, but a system can still be capitalist if there were, like, strict price controls in some area. America would still be capitalist if we nationalized housing, you know? So it's not... 
you know, it, economic and political systems are, are very rarely like, like, here's a clean cut line that defines them. Usually you have elements pulled from different directions. I just think it's way easier to describe Peron as an authoritarian than a fascist. I, I'm just not getting fascism vibes. You, you don't even have like the, the like in-group, out-group hysteria element, unless there's something I don't know about. Was, was Peron like crazy racist against some ethnic group in Argentina that he like rallied support against and his political power was based off it? Because it doesn't seem like it. It seems like he was mostly concerned with, you know, promoting himself as a leader of labor. The in-group, out-group hysteria isn't really necessary, i.e. Italy didn't have that. Um, well, Italy did it on like a national level, right? Like Italy, like the, the invasion of Ethiopia, but well, Italy, Italy definitely did this to an extent. I just don't think they did it as much as the Nazis. Um, but like no group did it as much as the Nazis. That's what made the Nazis unique, right? They were that bad. Uh, another research stream. I know far less about, uh, fascist Italy than I do fascist, um, Germany. Uh, Italy absolutely did that with the Greeks. Yeah. We just don't, I, I guess we don't really think of Italy that way because Italy and Spain have always been like the comedy, like sidekicks to the real bad guys of World War II, Japan and Germany. Like Italy and Spain don't even come close to Japan and Germany in terms of monstrous behavior. Certainly Italy comes closer than Spain's and Spain spent the entire time like sucking its own dick, but you know. Perico Finkelstein writes, if the question is asked if Peron was a fascist, the answer is no. But did fascism play an important role in the ideological genesis of Peronism? Although fascism was a central genealogy of Peronism, Peron coming to power signaled a break from diverse traditional precedents, including fascist nationalismo. However, the ideological continuities between Argentine fascism and Italian fascism are notable in Peron's military junta between 1943 and 46, and the first Peronist regime... Uh, from 46 to 55. Carlos Fate, Veit? Fate? states that Peronism was just an Argentine implementation of Italian fascism. Paul M. Hayes similarly concludes that the Peronist movement produced a form of fascism that was distinctly Latin American. It should be noted, by the way, and I do think there's something to get into here and we'll research it in the future, but Mussolini, Mussolini was, if I recall correctly, maybe disingenuously, but initially quite pro-worker um, in a way that like, the Nazis put basically no effort into pretending to be pro-worker. Like, they said they would be when they were running, and then as soon as they got power, they immediately stopped. Mussolini was, like, a socialist. <laughs> so, you know, a little bit of a horseshoe theory there. Instead, Felipe Pignan believes no research is... Okay, this, this is all, like, conjecture from historians. During his reign... No, I should, I should read it. I should read it. Pina argues Peron was only a pragmatist who took useful elements from all modern ideologies of the time. This included not only fascism, but also the New Deal policies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. To Pina, Peron was neither fascist nor anti-fascist, but simply a realist. This is called third positionism. It's just he's the only guy who did it unironically. The active intervention of the working class in politics, as he saw in those countries, was a definitive phenomenon. In 38, Peron was sent on a diplomatic mission to Europe. During this time, he became enamored of the Italian fascist model. Peron's admiration for Mussolini is well documented. Likewise, he took as a model of inspiration the government of Ionis. Ionis? Metazas? Metazax? Ionis? Ionis Metazax. This is, this is like a Mega Man boss ass name. Meet Me Texas? Metasas? Me Texas? Oh yeah, it's Greek. It's Greek, so it'd be yeah. Me Texas. Ionis Me Texas. There we go. Guys, I'm an American. I'm switching multiple. There's like German in here. There's like a lot of Spanish. I'm come on. I'm trying. Peron's admiration from blah, 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 blah. Italian fascism made people's... Oh, this is from Peron. Italian fascism made people's organizations participate more in the country's political stage. Before Mussolini's rise to power, the state was separate from the workers and the former had no involvement in the latter. Exactly the same process happened in Germany. That is, the state was organized to serve for a perfectly structured community, for a perfectly structured population. A community where the state was the tool of the people whose representation was, in my opinion, effective. Dude, he did, he did the meme. He did the mistake. You can't build a civil society through, like, state mandates. You can't do it. 
you you can try as hard as you want to go okay what if we did all of the like state organization of fascism except we did it for good things instead of bad things but you can't do it this is like this is the same rabbit hole every authoritarian falls down where they're like okay what if i just took all the power of the state and then i like made it do the good things like worker organization it doesn't work it has to be developed authentically it has to be developed democratically if you can't do it democratically you're not really building these institutions you're just propping up like you uh, okay it's like trying, trying to double jump in your leg of fight yeah yeah it's you're 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 not building the fundamental superstructure here the, the the civil society that allows these things to develop same thing with the soviet union yep there's a reason why for all its faults america has a pretty rich um uh uh, uh, uh civic uh infrastructure like a civil society whereas the soviet union a lot of other places in, in many ways they they failed to and a lot of that is because authoritarianism just fundamentally stifles the ability for local organization to take uh prominence you know if you live under the heel of an authoritarian it really stamps down your ability to self-manage a classic mistake exactly insincere complaint authoritarians always fail because they believe the state can act as a substitute for the proper construction of a superstructure, which is why the USSR was a broken mess. Yes, and why the USSR collapsed and then immediately turned into an oligarchical fascist society because not everything was fake. There was no like underlying system that that restru that like rebalanced towards anything even remotely worker oriented. You know, like the nanosecond it was possible through the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia just wing right, like right over to like terrible hyper individualist uh oligarchical autocracy because it's like there was nothing there there was not there was no superstructure there was no fabric of society to keep things held together during his reign peron and his administrators often resorted to organized violence and dictatorial rule he often showed contempt for any opponents and regularly characterized them as traitors and agents of foreign powers this is a classic fascist thing i will say subverted well it's an authoritarian thing but fascists also like doing it subverted freedom of speech and sought to crush any vocal dissidents through actions such as nationalizing the broadcasting system centralizing the unions under his control and monopolizing the supply of newspaper print oh another big thing here okay have the number of unions in your country very difficult balance to strike if you have too many they're too fractured and individualist if you have too few they effectively just become some gigantic umbrella state apparatus they become like yeah soviet unions or worse ccp unions you know in china a country with 1.4 billion people there's exactly one union controlled by the uh, party you're not you're not going to believe this guys but the union has not been successful in winning anything or any concessions with regards to labor rights from the uh, ccp you're not you're not going to believe this and monopolizing the supply of newspaper print. At the time, Perón also resorted to tactics such as illegally imprisoning opposition politicians and journalists, including radical civic union leader Ricardo Balbin, and shutting down opposition papers such as La Prensa. How do you unify without consolidating? Uh, I think that sectoral unions are good, but they can't be controlled by the state. If that's the case, it's you're not. then the state just becomes the minister of your oppression, you know? Protection of Nazi war criminals. After World War II, Argentina became a haven for Nazi war criminals with explicit protection from Perón, who even shortly before his death commented on the Nuremberg trials. Oh no. In Nuremberg at that time, something was taking place that I personally considered a disgrace and an unfortunate lesson for the future of humanity. Oh no. I became certain that the Argentine people also considered the Nuremberg process a disgrace, unworthy of the victors who behaved as the, if they hadn't been victorious. Now we realize the Allies deserve to lose the war. What does that mean? What do you mean? What does that mean? That's the heck of a pivot. This guy really did take ideas from every f political wing, man. Author y Yuki Gonyi? Gonyi alleges the Axis power collaborators, including Pierre Day, were met with Peron at Casa Rosada, the president's official executive mansion. In this meeting, a network would have citation or clarification needed been created with support of the Argentine administration service, foreign office, the Swiss chief of police, Heinrich Rothmund, and the Croatian priest, Kronoslav Dragenovic, also helped organize the rat line. The rat lines were systems of escape routes for German Nazis and other fascists fleeing Europe from 45 onward in the aftermath of World War II. The escape routes mainly led towards havens in Latin America, particularly Argentina, though also Paraguay, Colombia, so on and so forth. Okay, gotcha. Great.
An investigation of 22,000 documents in 1997 discovered the network was managed by Rodolfo Freud, who had an office in the Casa Rosada and was close to Eva Perón's brother, Juan Duarte. According to Ronald Luton, Ludwig Freud, Rodolfo's father, was probably the local representative of the Office 3 Secret Service headed by Joachim von Ribbentrop. Oh, that's a that's a that's a good That's a good name to see here. With probably more influence the German ambassador Edmund von Thurman. Examples of Nazis and collaborators who relocated Argentina included Emil de de Voitine, de, de Votin, because it'd be a W. De Voitina, who arrived in May 1946 and worked on the jet, of course. Enric Priebke, who arrived in 47. Oh, this is the French guy? Oh, this French name. Oh, this guy. That's right. That's right. Um, Joseph Mengel. Whoa! Him too? Hold on. The most evil man, you mean. Yeah, the uh, angel of death. Mengel died free. Yeah, I didn't know that, like, um, Peron's regime directly aided in his escape and protection. Lived in around Buenos Aires, then fled to, fled to uh, Paraguay and then Brazil, all while being sought by West Germany, Israel, and Nazi hunters such as... Suma. This is the only base thing that Israel and the Mossad ever did, by the way, was Nazi hunts. They would literally send, like, commando teams into Latin America being like, yep, find them, find them, find bring them back or kill them. Don't care. Doesn't matter. Do don't care if we have permission. Find them and kill them. That's the, that's the one based thing that the Mossad uh, ever did. Munich is such a great movie about it. I haven't seen it. He drowned in 79 after suffering a stroke while swimming off the coast of um, Bertioga. Bitch. Bitch made. Though the Mossad also allegedly recruited that one SS guy. Yeah, listen, okay. It, it, it takes a, a Nazi to hunt a Nazi, all right? They were asking like, uh, Scorzenzi, what would a Nazi do in this situation? They're all, they're all like, um, they're like giggling, you know, poking him with a stick. I use the German accent here because there were a lot of uh, 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 German Jews who led that program, as I understand it. Makes sense that, uh, you know, I can I can understand the cre career trajectory of a German Jew or Polish Jew or whatever, um, who was freed from like Auschwitz-Birkenau, went to Israel, and they were like, hey, do you want a job hunting Nazis? And he was like, you know, as a matter of fact, I kind of do, actually. Send me, tie me to a rocket and fire me at Buenos Aires, okay? I am... <laughs> 100 Nazi scalps. Uh, <laughs> so we um, so we helped a lot of Nazis, it seems. A Croatian priest, Raganovic, organizer of the San Girolamo rat line, was authorized by Peron to assist Nazi operatives. Love the fact that the rat line is the official term for it, by the way. To come to Argentina to evade prosecution in Europe after World War II. Da, 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 da. Man, it really, it really kind of feels like Peron was basically just thinking like, I like a lot of the things these fascists were doing, but they f***ed it all up by being racist or whatever. I'm going to try to do them one better. And that, they, they said so much about, like, workers' rights, and they didn't actually do it. I'm going to show them. Or so. it, it genuinely feels like he's trying to, like, outdo the fascists, you know? Jewish and German communities of Argentina. The German-Argentine community is the third largest immigrant group in the country after ethnic Spanish and Italians. Other <laughs> fascist countries. Um... The German-Argentine community predates Juan Perón's presidency and began during the political unrest of the 19th century unification of Germany. Isn't there like a German town in Argentina that's not actually Nazi shit? Where, where they're, they're all like doing lederhosen shit and, and, and everyone was like, oh, they're Nazis or whatever. But it turns out they've been there for like a long time. Though they probably took in a lot of Nazi war criminals, didn't they? Yeah, they probably would have taken in a lot. But the village predates... A visit, a visit to Bariloch, Argentine haven for fugitive Nazis. Cool. I guess it's like a tourist thing now. That's cool. Look at this German-ass tower right here. Look at these dorky Lederhoden, gigantic pint of beer, Oktoberfest mother... Look at this god... You can tell this tower's German. Look at these losers. These nerds. Yeah, well, that's Swedish, but same thing. Listen, if you're in Europe and you live near mountains. If you live anywhere even remotely near the Alps, okay? You're all the same to me, all right? I, I, I have the same, like, pan-German views the Nazis did, except racist against it, where it's like, yeah, if you're near the Alps, you are all one people, and you're stupid. <laughs> you're stupid. You have, you have Lederhosen, you have suspenders, uh, you have a stupid accent, I don't respect you. <laughs>
Vosh, this is a huge mischaracterization. The vast majority of Germans in Argentina have nothing to do with Nazis. I literally just said that. I, I literally said, like, the town was f from before the... Okay. Swabian, Bavarian, Northern Italian, Swiss. It doesn't matter to me, baby. Rallying against the Bavarians? Hold on. Bavarian traditional clothing. You'll rally against them, too. All right? I'm rallying. Superior people. I invoke my ass. Jesus Christ, look at this. Look at this. I love rallying. <laughs> Dork. Nerd. Nerd. This is the shit, by the way, that the Nazis were trying to convince their people was cool. That what like this is the return to tradition they were referring to. Okay? They were literally like the Nazi regime was like a contradictory blend of radical futurism, you know, shiny steel jets or whatever. And what if every man looked like this? Don't don't make me bust out the Hitler in shorts. This is this is what the Nazi project was building towards. A future where every man looked exactly like this. Hello, me and mine Fraulein were viewing you from across the bar and we yes, I can't remember. He has no chin. Uh, not a very handsome man, as it, as, it, as it turns out. He looks like Nazi Pee Wee Herman. I, I do, this is one of the reasons why I think Jojo Rabbit is one of the best movies ever made on the Nazis. Because the first premise of Jojo Rabbit is make them look ridiculous because they were ridiculous and they stuck with it. So many movies about the Nazis make them look like these like cold iron dictatorial like, you know, like machine men. That's how Nazis want to be seen. Nazis love the idea of being thought of as like machine men with iron hearts or whatever. Don't give them that. They love that shit. Okay. They're Dorky lunatics, okay? Any critical investigation of Nazi Germany reveals they were dorky lunatics, okay? Remind them of it. Yeah, I saw people... It's a, some liberals insist Jojo Rabbit is an evil movie because they think that by making fun of the Nazis, they're actually taking them lightly. Very stupid, very low IQ idea. The Nazis literally tried to breed back aurochs so they could LARP as cavemen hunting them. Wait, is that true? Heck cattle originated in Germany in the 20s and 30s in an attempt to breed back domestic cattle in their ancestral form, the aurochs. Why? Was this really so they could hunt them? Okay, whatever. Because LARP, being so returned tradi to a uh, tradition that you're like, yeah, we need like the way cows used to look too. <laughs> yeah, true palingenetic ultranationalism. Oh, hold on. Now we're on the second term. I feel like this Wikipedia article is kind of out of order. They go first term, then his downfall, then his controversies, then his, then it's like the second term. Read the part about Jewish immigration. While home, uh, Juan Perón's Argentina allowed many Nazi criminals to take refuge in the country following World War II, the society also accepted more Jewish immigrants than any other country in Latin America. Today, Argentina has a population of more than 200,000 Jewish citizens, the largest in Latin America, third largest in the Americas, sixth largest in the world. The Jewish Virtual Library writes that while he had sympathized with the Axis powers, Perón also expressed sympathy for Jewish rights, and in 1949 established diplomatic relations with the State of Israel. This guy really is just constantly unbelievable. Third positionism, what if we accepted both Jews and Nazis? Literally! The first Latin American government to do so. Since then, more than 45,000 Jews have emigrated to Israel from Argentina. Although anti-Semitism existed in Argentina, Perón's own views and his political associations were not anti-Semitic. Perón appointed several Jewish Argentinians as government advisors, such as his economic advisor, José Bergelbard. Gelbard. Jesus. He favored the creation of institutions such as New Zion, the Argentine Jewish Institute of Culture and Information. God damn, what is bro doing? He's doing everything, dude. He's all over the place. Okay, we only have an hour 15 left in stream, and we haven't even gotten to the Wikipedia article on parodism. So we're going to need to move a little bit faster than we have before. I feel like we've already learned a lot of stuff. So I, I'm, I feel pretty comfortable with that. Facing only token UCR and Socialist Party opposition, and despite being unable to field his popular wife, Eva, as a running mate, Perón was re-elected in 51 by a margin of over 30%. Okay. This election was the first to have extended suffrage to Argentine women and the first in Argentina to be televised. Perón was inaugurated on Channel 7 Public Television. He began his second term in 52 with serious economic problems, however, compounded by a severe drought that helped lead a half a billion dollar trade deficit. 
Divisions among Peronists intensified and the president's worsening mistrust led to the forced resignation of numerous uh, valuable allies, notably Buenos Aires province director Domingo Mercante. Again, on the defensive, Peron accelerated generals' promotions and extended them pay hikes and other benefits. Yeah, this is what I mean, by the way, about like authoritarianism as well. Um, it, you know, it, it leads to you creating sort of divisions within your own, like you distrust people around you, like, like this, this sort of stuff, you know, opposition to Peron grew bolder following Eva Peron's death on the 26th of July. On the 15th of April, a terrorist group never identified detonated two bombs in a public rally at Plaza de Mayo, killing seven and injuring 95. Amid the chaos, Peron exhorted the crowd to take reprisals. They made their way to the adversaries' gathering places, the Socialist Party headquarters, and aristocratic jockey club, and burned them to the ground. Dude, f what? Wait, there were... Bombs went off at a rally, and he f***ing January 6th, the opposition, for no reason? He was just like, oh, while well, you're all riled up, can you burn the opposition headquarters down to the ground? Holy shit. Doing some Reichstag shit. Might have false flagged that one. Never identified the terrorist group. Hmm. The president remained generally popular, despite all this. Peron ventured into a new policy. The creation of incentives designed to attract foreign investment. Hmm, okay. Drawn to an economy with the highest standard of living in Latin America and a new steel mill in San Nicolas de los Arroyos. Arroyos. Automakers Fiat and Kaiser Motors. Hmm. Responded to the initiative by breaking around new facilities in the city of um, Cordoba, as did the freight truck of Daimler Benz for such investments since GM's Argentine assembly line opened in 26. Goddamn. Standard Oil of California. Doo -doo -doo -doo. As 1954 drew to a close, Peron unveiled reforms far more controversial to the normally conservative Argentine uh, public the legalization of divorce and of prostitution. Huh. Man, even this far in, even this much of an authoritarian, and he's still, like, unironically doing social justice stuff. This would have been, do you think this was in, like, respect for his wife? Because his wife was the main advocate for the, like, feminism and social justice stuff, and she died. So he's like, okay, divorce and sex work, right? In, a, in like, a Catholic country. Yeah, an unconservative authoritarian. What a remarkable person. The Roman Catholic Church's Argentine leaders whose support of Perón's government had been steadily waning since the advent of Eva Perón Foundation. Yep, the Catholics were mad that a woman had power and was pursuing social justice. Were now open antagonists of the government and had been steadily waning, uh, or sorry, the man they called the tyrant, though much of Argentina's media had since the 50s been controlled by Mondor administration. Lurid pieces of his ongoing relationship with an underaged girl. Oh no! Ah, well, well, that's how the Catholic Church should have known he's a real Catholic. How can they oppose this? Named Nelila Rivas, also known as Nelly, something Peron never denied, filled the gossip pages. Pressed by reporters on whether his supposed new paramour was, as the magazines claimed, 13 years of age, the 59-year-old Peron responded that he was not superstitious? What? 13, too. That's not like... It's not... That's not like a 17 and a half. Jesus Christ. The response was like, yeah, I'm not afraid of God. What the... F it's so over. It might be... It might be over forever this time, guys. I don't know. Oh, because 13 is an unlucky number. Ah, so he was being witty, I see. Before long, the president's humor on the subject ran out, and following the expulsion of two Catholic priests he believed to be behind his recent image problems, a 15th of June 1955 declaration of the sacred consistorial congregation, not of the Pope himself, who alone had authority to excommunicate a head of state, was interpreted as declaring Peron excommunicated. The following day, Peron called for a rally of support on the Plaza de Mayo, a time-honored custom among Argentine presidents during a challenge. However, as he spoke before a crowd of thousands, Navy fighter jets flew overhead and dropped bombs into the crowded square below before seeking refuge in Uruguay? What the f***? The incident part of a coup attempt against Peron. What kind of coup attempt is just f***ing bombing a rally? killed 364 people and was, from historical perspective, the only air assault ever on Argentine soil, as well as a portent of the mayhem that Argentine society would suffer in the 70s. It moreover touched off a wave of reprisals on the part of Peronists, 
Reminiscent of the incidents in 53, Peronist crowds sacked 11 Buenos Aires churches, including the Metropolitan Cathedral. On the 16th of September, a nationalist Catholic group from both the Army and Navy, led by General Eduardo Lunardi, General Pedro E. Aramburu, and Admiral Isaac Rojas, led a revolt from Cordoba. They took power in a coup three days later, which they named the Revolución Libertadora. Uh, Perón barely escaped with his life, leaving Nelly Rivas behind, probably for the best for her, I hope, and fleeing on the gunboat, the ARP Paraguay, provided by Paraguayan leader Alfredo Stroessner up the Piranha River. Piranha River. Piranha. Piranha River. At that point, Argentina was more politically polarized than it had been since 1880. The landowning elites and other conservatives pointed to an exchange rate that had rocketed from 4 to 30 pesos per dollar and consumer prices had shown revenue to five holes. That's it. And then he went into exile. The new military regime went to great lengths to destroy both Juan and Eva Perón's reputation, highlighted the association between Peronism and Nazism that ac accused Perón of having committed genocide. Lenardi's replacement, Lieutenant General Pedro Aramburu, outlawed the mere mention of Juan or Eva Perón's names under Decree Law 4161-56. Throughout Argentina, Peronism and the very display of Peronist mementos was banned. So I think the lesson from all of this is don't 13-year-olds, because it really seems like everything went downhill after that. Like, that really, that seems like that was like the huge crux, you know? An important lesson. Perón himself suffered a number of attempted kidnappings and assassinations ordered by uh, uh, Aramburu continuing to exert considerable direct influence over Argentine politics despite the ongoing ban of the Justicialist Party as Argentina geared for the 58 elections, Perón instructed his supporters to cast their ballots for the moderate Arturo Frondizi, a splinter candidate within the Peronists' largest opposition party, the Radical Civic Union. Frondizi went on to defeat the better-known but more anti-Peronist leader Ricardo Balbin. Perón backed a popular union in 1962. Perón advised his followers to cast blank ballots in the 63 elections. Perón's stay in Venezuela had been cut short in this ousting. He met the nightclub singer Maria Estela Martinez, known as Isabel, settled in Madrid under the protection of Francisco Franco. Okay. Married Isabel in 61, was admitted back into the Catholic Church in 63. Okay. Failed attempt to return to Buenos Aires. Accompanying her to Spain, López Rega, worked for Perón's security before becoming the couple's personal secretary. A return of the popular union in 65 and their victories in congressional elections that year helped lead to the overthrow of the moderate president Arturo Illia and the return of dictatorship. Cool. Perón became increasingly unable to control the CGT itself. Here we go. Vandor challenged Perón from 65 to 68 by defying Perón's call for an electoral boycott with mottos such as Peronism without Perón, and to save Perón, one has to be against Perón. Dictator Ongañas' uh, continued repression of labor demands, however, helped lead to Vendor's reapproachment with Perón, a development cut short by Vendor's as yet unsolved 69 murder. Okay. Labor agitation increased. Opposition to the dictatorship increased. Perón started courting the far left during Ongaña's dictatorship. In his book, La Jora de los Pueblos, Perón enunciated the main principles of the purported new tricontinental political vision. Mao is at the head of Asia, Nasser of Africa, de Gaulle of the old Europe, and Castro of Latin America. What? What, what are you cooking? In 68? Nasser? of all Latin America? Okay, this is incoherent. De Gaulle? Okay, okay, okay. This this is this is incoherent. This this is this is just like anti what This is dude, he's doing it. He's this is literally just um in uh anti-western. This is uh um campism. This is just bricks. Yeah. Okay. He, yeah, he's trying to appeal to, like, essentially Soviets, to, to people who back the Soviet Union or support the Soviet Union. Was de Gaulle anti-Western? No, but that's why he says of the old Europe. He's, he's implying it's tricontinentalist political vision, and then he says of the old Europe, implying that Europe is, like, dying or falling, you know? De Gaulle was as pro-West as it could get. I mean, it's it's like it's like a Saddam Hussein or like a, a, a you know like a Gaddafi thing, right? He was anti-UK and anti-US and every anti everything. I mean, I I think this is just a kind of like weird, blurry. Okay, 
does this not feel like a kind of weird um what's the term the russian um the the russian uh political thought leader dugin it's it's like it's like a weird kind of Duganism almost, you know, like like uh, Duganism zero point five. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. This seems incoherent without more information. I don't know. It's just anti Anglo shit. Well, that's a pretty big part of Duganism, you know. De Gaulle was pro France above everything else. Yeah, I, I know. But like the tri continental thing kind of implies a rejection of Western. Okay, whatever. Whatever. Okay, so he started doing all this shit. He also cultivated ties with ultra conservatives and the extreme right. Okay, cool. Great. We, we love a third positionist and their wacky, wacky adventures. He supported the leader of the conservative wing of the UCR, his erstwhile prisoner. Okay, the main thing this means more than anything else is that he's illiberal. Um, he, like, whether he sides with fascists or with, like, Mao or whoever else, like, the main thing he opposes is liberalism. Like, that's what he's opposing here. Former military units to maintain close links to Montenegro a far left Catholic Peronist group. Montenegro is a kidnapped and assassinated former anti Peronist president at Umbudu in retaliation for the mass execution of Peronist uprising against the junta. Okay. A lot of people dying over here. When I tie ultra nationalist because right. Oh my god. How much shit can happen? You have so much shit happening in your country. Don't skip over the fascism. I'm just trying to get the bit of it. We're, we're not skipping over everything. This is too densely packed to skip anything. I, like, we're running out of time. There was other shit I had to look at. Founded in the early 1960s, the Takuras were a fascist, anti-Semitic, and conformist group founded on the model of Primo de Rivera's Falange, at first strongly opposed Peronism. However, they split after the 59 Cuban Revolution into three groups. The one most opposed the Peronist alliance, led by Catholic priest Julio uh, Menville, retained the original hardline stance. The new Argentina movement, the MNA, headed by Dardo Cabo, was founded on the 9th of June, 1961, to confederate General Valle's Peronist uprising on the same date in 56, to become the precursor of all modern Catholic nationalist groups in Argentina. And the revolutionary nationalist Takura movement, the MNRT, founded by Joe Baxter and Jose Luis Nell, who joined Peronism, believing its capacity for evolution. Okay, so everyone, okay, yeah, truly the everyone party. No wonder Peronism is the only real ideology in Argentina. Holy shit. Everyone, everyone, Peronism, everything, every, all of them. I'm a right-wing Peronist. I'm a left-wing Peronist. I'm a tradcath Peronist, everything, all Peronists. Jesus Christ. Broke with the church and abandoned anti-Semitism. Baxter's MNRT became progressively Marxist, as well as the Montanos of the Epic rap battle of history. Wait, no. Wrong. My brain is fried after all this. Following Angania's replacement in 1970, General Roberto M. Levingston was the replacement of Argentina's myriad political parties with four or five. This attempt to govern indefinitely against the will of the different political parties, United Peronists, and their opposition in a joint declaration November 11th, billed as La Hora del Pueblo, the Hour of the People, which called for free and immediate democratic elections to end the political crisis. The uh, declaration was signed by the Radical Civic Union, Justicialist Party, the Argentine Socialist Party, the Democratic Progressive Party, and the Partido Bloquista. Okay, so everyone came together in 1970. And they were like, what if we did democracy instead of 57 military juntas in a row? We, we, the 57 branches of Peronism, are coming together to form a democracy. Okay, great. The opposition's call for elections led to Levingston's replacement by General Alejandro Lanús. Lanús in March 1971, faced with strong opposition, social conflicts, General Lanús declared his intention to restore constitutional democracy by 73, though without Peronist participation. Okay, so this guy... Is like, okay, we can bring in a democracy eventually, but no Peronism, he said, to a political environment packed with Peronists of every flavor. Lenosa proposed the Gran Acuerdo Nacional, the Great National Agreement, in July 1971, which was to find an honorable exit for the military junta without allowing Peronism to participate in the election. The proposal was ejected by Peron, really who formed the uh, Fresilina Alliance, the Frente Civico de Liberacion, uh, Li Liberacion Nacional Civic Front of National Liberation, headed by his new delegate Hector Jose Campora, a member of the Peronist left. The alliance gathered motion to reject Peronism, rejected by Peron and his, per his Peronist alliance. The Alliance gathered his Justicialist Party and the Integration and Development Movement, headed by Arturo Frondizi. Fraquilina pressed for free and unrestricted elections, which ultimately did take place in March 73. Okay.
Oh, that's that's where that. Okay. Relationship with Che Guevara. Interesting, but we have to move on. Third term. General elections were held on the 11th of March, 1973. Peron was banned from running, but a stand-in, Dr. Hector Campora, a left-wing Peronist and his personal representative, won the election and took office on the 25th of May. On the 20th of June, 73, Peron returned from Spain to end his 18-year exile. According to Pagina 12 newspaper, Licio Gelli, master of propaganda du, had provided an Alitalia plane to return Peron to his native country. Getty was part of a committee supporting Perón, along with Carlos Sol Menem, future president of Argentina, okay, the former Italian premier, um, Giulio Andre, Andreotti, recalled an encounter between Perón and his wife Isabel and Gelli, saying that Perón knelt before Licio Gelli to salute him. Camporo Vash for sake learn one pronunciation, and you're banned. I have had to put up with so much can pronunciation shit this stream. Not today. On the day of Peron's return, a crowd of left-wing Peronists estimated at 3.5 million, according to police. Wow, for all of the f***s Peron did, th this is still the best they ever got, huh? Like, for all the shit they went through, like, it's still, it's still like, it, it's still like, that's it. Like, this is the only guy, you know? Peron left, and then it was just a succession of military dictatorships. Gathered at... Eziza, Ezieza Airport in Buenos Aires to welcome him. Peron was accompanied by Campora, whose first measures were to grant amnesty to all political prisoners and reestablish relations with Cuba, helping Fidel Castro break the U.S. embargo against Cuba. This, along with his social policies, has earned him the opposition of right-wing Peronists, including the trade unionist bureaucracy. Love opposing Peron as a right-wing Peronist. <laughs> Jesus. Camouflage snipers open fire on the crowd at the airport. Okay. The left-wing Peronist Youth Organization and the Montaneros had been trapped. At least 13 were killed and 365 injured in this episode, which became known as the Ezieza Massacre. Campora and Vice President Vicente Solano Lima resigned in 73, paving the way for new elections, this time with Peron's participation as the Judicialist Party nominee. Argentina faced mounting political instability. How? How is it mounting at this point? It's not mounting. It's been mounted. It's on the mount. It's on. It's at the top of the hill. It's not mounting. Every time you have a f***ing political rally, somebody bombs or shoots it, and you've had 50 dictators in the past decade. What are you talking about? And Perón was viewed by many as the country's only hope for prosperity and safety. UCR leader Ricardo Balbín and Perón contemplated a Peronist radical joint government, but opposition in both parties made this impossible. Besides opposition among Peronists, Ricardo Balbín had to consider opposition within the UCR itself, led by Raúl Alfosín, a leader among the UCR center-left. Perón received 62% of the vote. Huge! returning him to the presidency. He began his third term on October 12th, 1973, with Isabel, his wife, as vice president. I wonder what happened to the kid he was raping. <laughs> did, did she... I hope she didn't get, like, murdered by people who thought that she was, like, responsible or something, you know? They kind of dropped her narratively, which I guess makes sense, but, like, you know. I hope he didn't hit her up when he made his way back to town. Well, she'd be an adult by then. On Perón's advice... Uh, Campora had appointed Jose Bergelbald, Gelbard, that's so hard to say, Gelbard, as policy advisor to the critical economic uh, ministry, inheriting an economy that had doubled in output since 55 with little indebtedness and only modest new foreign investment. Inflation had become a fixture in daily life and was worsening. Consumer prices rose by 80% in the year to May 1973. Jesus. Making this a policy priority, uh, Bergelbard crafted a social pact in hopes of finding a happy median between the needs of management and labor. Mmm. Providing a framework for negotiating price controls, guidelines for collective bargaining, and a package of subsidies and credits, the pact was promptly signed by the CGT, then the largest labor union in South America, and management, represented by Julio Bronner and the CGE. The measure was largely successful. Initially, inflation slowed to 12%, and real wages rose by over 20% during the first year. That's pretty good. GDP growth accelerated from 3% in 72 to over 6% in 74. The plan also um, envisaged the paydown of Argentina's growing public external debt, then around 8 USD billion within four years. 
the improving economic situation encouraged Perón to pursue interventionist social and economic policies similar to those he had carried out in the 40s, nationalizing banks and various industries, subsidizing native businesses and consumers, regulating and taxing the agricultural sector, reviving the IAPI, placing restrictions on foreign investment. No, oh no, Perón, no. Be careful, Perón. No, he's got his AirPods in. He can't see foreign investment is the modern economy. And funding a number of social welfare programs. In addition, new rights for workers were introduced. The 1973 oil shock, however, forced Bear Gelbard to rethink the central bank's projected re uh, I've talked for so much this stream. To rethink the central bank's projected reserves and accordingly undid planned reductions in stubborn budget deficits, then around $2 billion a year. Increasingly frequent collective bargaining agreements in excess of social pact wage guidelines and a resurgence in inflation led to growing strain on the viability of the plan by mid-1974, however. Perón's third term was also marked by an escalating conflict between the Peronist left and right-wing factions. This turmoil was fueled primarily by calls for repression against the left on the part of leading CGT figures, a growing segment of the armed forces, particularly the Navy and right-wing radicals within his own party, most notably Perón's most fascist advisor, Jose Lopez Rega. I love to have, I, I love to cultivate a diverse cabinet of opinions by having, uh, my, my communist and my fascist ministers to advise me, you know? My most fascist advisor, I should say. Appointed Minister of Social Welfare. Why, uh, why would you put your fascist advisor in charge of social welfare? Put, the, okay. Was in practice given po power far beyond his purview, soon controlling up to 30% of the federal budget. What? Diverting increasing funds, he formed the AAA, a death squad. I wonder if there's any uh, long-term consequences to diverting a lot of power and money to uh, fascists in Latin America. You know, I'm, I'm contemplating that. I'm wondering, ah, of course, the Argentine Anti-Communist Alliance, okay? Because look, folks, there are a lot of anti-communists out there, but the only people who call themselves anti-communists are fascists. Regular, normal liberals are ideologically anti-communists, but don't call themselves that. Only fascists call themselves anti-communists. A death squad that soon began targeting not only the violent left, but moderate opposition as well. The Montaneros became marginalized in the Peronist movement and were mocked by Peron himself after the Ezeza massacre. Oh, that's cool of you, Peron. In his speech to the governors on the 2nd of August, Peron openly criticized a radical Argentine youth for a lack of political maturity. So here we have it, folks. The same fate as every other authoritarian. Your initial interests might seem principled. Maybe you're doing it for a good reason, but at the end of the day, it always ends up it always ends up going down the exact same path every time with every person, no matter how principled you are. If you don't build a civil superstructure that uh, allows your country to naturally grow in a uh, pro labor direction, if you're forcing it on them through authoritarian governance, even if the things that you're forcing on the state are good, at the end of the day, authoritarianism is just innately self-defeating, and it will inevitably cede power to people who use it irresponsibly, to speak nothing of the problems with using it even for good. The rift between Perón and the far left became irreconcilable following the 25th of September 1973, the murder of José Ignacio Rossi, the moderately conservative secretary general of the CGT. Rossi was killed in a commando ambush in front of his residence. His murder was long attributed to the Monteneros, whose record of violence was well established by then, but it is arguably Argentina's most prominent unsolved mystery. Hmm. A false flag, perhaps? Another guerrilla group, the uh, Guevarist... The... Guevarist ERP also opposed the Peronist right wing. They started engaging in armed struggle, assaulting an important army barracks in just that's just called an important army barracks. They didn't there's no name for it. In Azul, Buenos Aires province, the nineteenth of January, creating a foco in insurrection in Tucumán, a historically underdeveloped province in Argentina's largely rural northwest. In May 1973, the ERP claimed to have extorted one million in goods from the Ford Motor Company after murdering one executive and wounding another. Okay. Five months after the payment, the guerrillas killed another Ford executives and a three bodyguard. Only after Ford threatened to close down their operation in Argentina altogether did Perón agree to have his army protect the plant. What is happening here? Direct action? Okay, not to say that Ford company executives are good people or anything, but if you're a Guevarist, like, 
guerrilla warfare cell, shouldn't you be more concerned with killing the active death squad controlled by fascists and government and not just like killing Ford exec like were the Ford executives working in line with the death squad or were you because this just it seems like you're like the wrong target but that's hard ah yes they were getting funds not just randomly killing Ford executives so so they were literally just doing this for money so okay whatever thrones failing health complicated matters I I, I love Latin America leftism fucking he may have been senile by the time he was sworn in for his third term. His wife had to frequently take an over as acting uh, president. You need money for uh, to uh, fund an insurgency? Yeah, but there were literally concentration camps and Ford plants here in Argentina. Wouldn't they have been controlled by Perón or the military dictatorships, not like by Ford themselves? I feel like there are better targets to go after, but I admit that I don't know enough about the subject to really say. Preside over the nuclear power plant. Diminishing support from the far left turned to open MD following rallies on the Plaza de Mayo on the 1st of May and 12th of June, in which the president condemned their demands and increasingly violent activities. Uh, did Peron ever condemn the AAA far right death squad? I hope he did. No, Ford in South America was hellish and influence was a cross between Dubai and Auschwitz. In the 70s? I I'll look more into it. I'll look more into it. Yeah, have you condemned Hamas? Okay. Peron returned to Buenos Aires with clear signs of pneumonia, had a series of heart attacks, and then he died. The 1st of July, Monday, 1974. A complicated man, but also a child rapist uh, and authoritarian. So, a complicated but bad. Sorry, that's the opinion I'm coming away with. You can be, you can be as pro-labor as you want to be, uh, unless you're willing to build that superstructure, like, and, and man, the pedophilia thing, it's like, it's like we're firing low, man. Mao and Stalin both 14 year olds, right? And now he's 13 year old. It's like, we're going lower and lower. Did Castro f any kids? Didn't Castro just f adults? Was Castro okay? That we know of? Okay. Seems like Castro didn't have any issue f you know, adults. So, I mean, not that that ever stops these f Authoritarians love being pedophiles. That's why fascists tend to be. Peron's corpse was first transported by Hearse. Okay, what bad shit is going to happen? Hundreds of armed soldiers lined the 16-kilometer route from the palace to Olivos uh, to restrain the crowd. As many as 2,000 foreign journalists covered the ceremony. 21-gun salute. Three days of official mourning were declared thereafter. Peron had recommended that his wife, Isabel, rely on Balbian for support. And at the president's burial, Balbin uttered a historic phrase. The old adversary bids farewell to a friend. Aw. That's some very, like, history. That's a very history statement right there. Isabel Perón succeeded her husband to the presidency, but could not manage the country's problems, including the left and right-wing insurgencies. Great. Ignoring her late husband's advice, Isabel gave Balbin no role in her new government, instead granting broad power to López Rega. Oh, the most fascist guy. Cool. Who started a dirty war against political opponents. I know about this conflict. I've read about this. The name used by the military junta, or civic military dictatorship of Argentina, for the period of state terrorism from 1974 to 83 as part of Operation Condor, the U.S.-backed campaign, the cia back. Yeah, that the United States uh, uh, facilitated during which military and security forces and death squads in the form of the Argentine Anti-Communist Alliance hunted down political dissidents and anyone associated to have been uh, anyone believed to have been associated with socialism, left wing Peronism or the Montaneros movement estimated between 22,000 and 30,000 people were killed or disappeared. That's um, one Gaza Strip since October 7th worth of people, more or less. Goddamn, that's the disappearance Mille denies. Oh, right. Mille, the current leader of Argentina, has played defense for this quite a bit. There are people associated with this that he idolizes. Um, he he denies that like a lot that people were killed or disappeared. He said he said this hasn't happened. In case you're wondering, yeah. From October 8th, 2023, Mille doubles down on denialism and accusations against Bullrich. Millet emphasized to Legrand he thinks what happened during the 70s in Argentina was a war. So 
so right this this is a conspiracy so the idea here is that like oh the government did kill and disappear people but it was part of like a mutual conflict he downplays how many people were killed or disappeared uh he denies essentially like the war crime element the way he frames it is like yeah the government fought against left-wing militias like yeah there was fighting when in reality it was more like a campaign of terrorism and disappearances you know therefore the excess violence committed that are beyond the crimes against humanity and have to be punished Essentially, he denies the government did anything wrong. The military fascists stole babies from leftist families they murdered. Neat. Well, anyway, let's let's finish. I feel I feel like man, Peronism and Argentinian or Argentine lo, like recent history really are one and the same, huh? I feel like I know so much more. This has been. Oh, very good. And by the way, very cursory, very light touch bit of research here. Like we're, you know, we're, we're learning a lot. This is when they threw communists out of helicopters. That was, you're thinking of Pinochet in Chile. Um, but they probably did that too. I don't know. Oh yeah. Um, Vignesk. They did it too. Don't know if that happened here too. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Relationship with Allende and Pinochet. <laughs> Peron praised Allende for his valiant attitude of committing suicide. <laughs> this is the guy that, um, that Pinochet replaced. He was a leftist leader and the United States, uh, assisted in Pinochet's military coup over him. That he was, he was, no, 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 no. Peron wasn't saying you should kill yourself. He was saying, wow, you've defied the United States. Enjoy your suicide. Mausoleum and legacy. God damn. What a, what a storied life. Allende was kind of cool. Well, he was better than the guy who replaced him, that's for sure. Ideologically populist. Peronism is widely considered to be a variant of left-wing populism, although some describe it as a Latin American form of fascism. Others have criticized this as one-dimensional for having negative connotations, as it also includes a form of national populism and national socialism, a term that has no negative connotations. Peronism was also described as socialist by some political scientists who classify it as nationalist socialism, non-Marxist socialism, Christian socialism. Others say it's a paternalistic conservative ideology. Okay, great. So a consequence of being an authoritarian populist is that you have no real ideology. <laughs> Like the like every that this is why Peronism seems to encompass literally every part of Argentine political. It's all four squares, yeah, on the on the political compass chart or whatever. Because like it doesn't mean anything anymore. When you're when you're authoritarian and you work with the left and the right wing, like nothing means anything. Damn sure would love this guy. Unironically, yes. A vague blend of nationalism and laborism or populism. So I can't even say that I'm a fan of Peronism because it doesn't mean anything. I like some of the stuff Peron did, but I dislike a lot of other stuff. The only person here who's coming out unscathed is Eva Peron, who, who I stan, okay? That's that's the ideology I'm coming with, uh, coming, coming with out of this. I, I, like that's, that's the person I respect. This explains why there are no YouTube videos on this. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, no kidding. We've, we've done three hours of research now to arrive at the conclusion that this ideology doesn't mean anything. Nowadays, Eva Peron has been sort of the revered face of the social justice movement. That makes sense, and I like that. So she is kind of like an angel. Eva Peron created the AAA who persecuted left-wingers. She did that? I thought the other guy did that. I thought the fascists did that. Not that one. Lopez did. Yeah, yeah, she didn't do that. She died way before that came into power. That, that was Isabel, the other wife. Dude, she's so cute. It makes sense anyway, okay? Ava is a innately proletarian name, and Isabel is an innately fascist name. Can we all agree? Isabel just st strikes me of it's just, it's, it's an innately fascist name. I'm I'm horoscoping this. It's true. All right. So we are going to let's see. Peron's death left an intense power vacuum, and the military promptly overthrew Isabel. That's the second wife. Since the return to democracy in 1983, Peronist candidates have dominated the presidency. As of 2023, Peronists held the presidency for 28 years. But it doesn't mean anything. Carlos Menem was elected in 89 and served for two consecutive terms over 10 years. Menem moved the party to center-right. 
Um, his main focus was the privatization of state-run enterprises. Yeah, I love being a parent. Yeah, 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 I love uh, I love Peronism where you privatize state-run enterprise. That's a thing Peron did, you know? Like, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, so Peronism just mean politics in Argentina. That's literally all it means. Like, Mille could have called himself a Peronist. Why not? He only didn't to paint himself as an outsider. After the De La Roa De, De La Roa administration collapsed, two interim Peronist leaders took over. Blah, 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 blah. Twenty Peronist tenants. It doesn't matter because none of this means anything. Look at all the branches. Internal currents. Neo Peronism. Orthodox Peronism. This is like the world's first, like always online. That video I showed earlier, where it's like Peron is an ideology meme video where he's shifting all about the, the compass or whatever, that was real. And all Peronists continue to hold themselves to that tendency. Holy shit. Attitudes towards indigenous people. Actually, I'm curious about this. Recognize indigenous people's Argentine citizens. Mapuche leader um, Geronimo Malicchio described indigenous peoples as the first Peronists with Peron turning a previously invisible group in Argentinian society to active political actors. That's nice. That's not very fascist. Okay, I actually don't think there's any point in looking at Peronism from this point forward, because as we've established, we now understand why it's incoherent. None of it means anything. But we understand why it doesn't mean anything, which is important. So I think at this point, I would rather just very like quickly read up on uh, Argentine history after the death of Peron, by which I mean Wikipedia. Look of Kirshnerism? I mean, that'll probably come up, right? Where do I click for Argentina? President of Argentina. Give me Argentina. Let me click there. Argentina. Nice. Peron's return and death. There we go. National reordering process. The Dirty War, a part of Operation Condor, where the United States openly assisted in the murder of many tens of thousands of left-wing and even center-leaning Latin Americans because it served our geopolitical interests, even though it didn't really in the long run. Check out Kemalism too. We have been doing this for three and a half hours. We will check out what we can, please. I'm not purporting to be an expert on Argentine political history, okay? I am trying my best. There are lots of things. There's, it's an infinite rabbit hole. Victims of the violence in Argentina included 15 to 30,000 left-wing activists and militants, trade unionist students, journalists, Marxists, Peronist guerrillas, and alleged sympathizers. Most of the victims were casualties of state terrorism. The opposing guerrillas' victims numbered nearly 500 to 540 military and police officials and up to 230 civilians. Okay. Argentina received technical support and military aid from the U.S. government during the Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Reagan administrations. Man, truly, really, really puts to, uh, to, to the lie the idea that uh, when it came to foreign policy, you know, we really had much of a choice when it came to our, uh, our votes in, you know? Thanks, everyone. Thank you, all fucking American presidents. That's so nice of you. Ungania shut down Congress, banned all political parties, and dismantled student and worker unions. Okay, wait, that's earlier. We, lo we looked at that already. Peron died and was succeeded by his wife, who signed a secret decree empowering the military and poli uh, police to annihilate the left wing subversion. F you, bitch. Stop the airpiece of time. The national reorganization process, one year later, often shortened to Prosecco. Wait, isn't that a food? <laughs> Pro Proceso? Proceso. Um. So this is just a military dictatorship. The national reorganization process is a euphemism for a dictatorship. The Proceso shut down Congress, removed the judges on the Supreme Court, banned political parties and unions, and resorted to employing the forced disappearance of suspected guerrilla members, including individuals suspected of being associated with the left wing, uh, securing the junta's position in power. In 77, Argentina set up a military base on the uninhabited British South Sandwich Islands in the South Atlantic Ocean. In 82, an Argentine force took control of the British territory of South Georgia, and in the 2nd of April, they invaded the Falkland Islands. The UK quickly dis we all know what happened next. The UK quickly dispatched a task force to regain possession. After a short bloody conflict, Argentina surrendered on the 14th of June, and its forces were sent home street riots in Buenos Aires following the humiliating defeat and the military leadership stood down. Reynaldo Bignona Bignone? replaced, replaced uh, Galtiere and began to organize the transition to democratic governance. Okay, so this guy, so, so I guess, is Margaret Thatcher 
responsible for democracy in Argentina because the defeat in the Falklands was what led to the disgraceful resignation of the military dictatorship. Thank you, Thatcher, for all the good you've done for the people of Argentina. Truly an international ally of, of democracy. In 2010, this guy was sentenced to 25 years in prison for his role in the kidnapping, torture, and murder of people during the Dirty War. Nice. We love to see uh, uh, government-appointed war criminals uh, put to prison. That's, that's, that's great. Wait. He was put to 25 years in prison in 2010, but this is what he looked like in 82? How f***ing old is he? He got sentenced to prison 28 years after this. Well, he's dead now? Oh, right. Yeah, well, still. Very old. Died at 90 in prison. Millet wants to free him? That would be impressive, considering the fact that he died in 2018, but, you know. Uh, anyway. Raul Alfosin won the 83 elections, campaigning for the prosecution of those responsible for human rights violations during the Prosecco. The trial of the Juntas. What a based name and other martial courts sentence all the coup's leaders but under military pressure he also enacted the full stop and do obedience laws what and what what does the full stop law do exempted subordinates from prosecution when they were carrying out orders later in 2003 and 5 these would be repealed and rendered unconstitutional okay so the military dictatorship was like hey yeah you really shouldn't like prosecute all of us we were just following orders Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so this was their desperate attempt to avoid, like, literally all being sent to uh, the gallows. Gotcha. Do they have the death penalty in Argentina? They do not. They abolished it in 1984. Huh. Um, interestingly, they abolished it right after democracy was returned. I wonder what those uh, dictators were doing. Hmm. Halted prosecutions down the, uh, further down the chain of command. The worsening economic crisis and hyperinflation reduced his popular support. And the Peronist, wow, a Peronist? Carlos Menem won the 1989 election. Soon after, riots forced Alfonso to an early resignation. Menem embraced and enacted neoliberal policies, a fixed exchange rate, business deregulation, privatizations, and the, I love Peronism, and the dismantling of protectionist barriers normalized the economy in the short term. He pardoned the officers who had been sentenced during Alfosin's government. Oh, so he just went and par- okay. Wait, does that mean the other guy was pardoned as well? No, no, because he was sentenced in 2010. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Menem made uh, inflation illegal. Very smart. The 1994 constitutional amendment allowed Menem to be uh, elected for a second term, with the economy beginning to decline in 95. And with guys, I'm going to be honest with you, I have no fucking idea, no fucking idea how to fix Argentina's economy. Like there are problems with other countries' economies that I've thought, okay, it would be tough to do, but I think this would help. I have no fucking idea what's going on here. I don't think I'm ever going to know. I'd have to learn more. I'd have to like learn too much. Maybe nobody knows. The UCR, led by Fernando uh, de la Rua, returned the presidency in the 1999 elections. De la Rua left Menem's economic plan in effect despite the worsening crisis, which led to growing social discontent. Massive capital flight from the country was responded to with a freezing of bank accounts. Ooh, you don't want to do that. Generating further turmoil. The December 2001 riots forced him to resign. This is huge. I know this much. Uh, the 2001 riots are like a national these are like a monumental nationally recognized huge like civil unrest turning point uh yeah in the way of the resignation a period of political instability uh, known as the argentine great depression lasted from 1998 to 2002 39 people were killed by police and security forces of the 39 killed nine were minors beginning of december 21 the imf cut off flow of funds capital flight became uncontrollable oh shit with 25% of all the money in Argentine banks having been withdrawn since the beginning of the year. What the fuck? All of it? 25% of all of their fucking money? Holy shit. Finance Minister Cavallo announced a national cash withdrawal limit of 250 a week. Holy shit. Why would you do that? Oh my God. Would you, cash withdrawal limits are like the in, like firing a, a flare into the sky, telling everyone to burn down their local bank. 
Yeah, prevent. Yeah, preventing runs on banks just never works. It does not work. You, 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 there, there are, you, you can't do it. You can't do it. Oh man, why doesn't it work? Massively worsens the panic. Yeah, invest in cryptocurrency. Um, Congress appointed Eduardo um, Duhalde as acting president, who revoked the fixed exchange rate established by Minem. Um, Uh, causing many working and middle-class Argentines to lose a significant portion of their savings. By late 2002, the economic crisis began to recede, but the assassination of two piqueteros, member of a group that has blocked a street with the purpose of calling a demonstration. Ah, this is one of the reasons why Millet's current government is talking about the revocation of rules made after this crisis, because he's saying that he will like massively punish people who block the roads. So like this, this led to like a huge amount of, of national controversy. Political unrest. Nestor Kirchner was elected as the new president. Look at his, look at his hair. What an untrustworthy face. He looks like a frog. A member of the Justicialist Party. Oh, you're telling me that he's a Peronist. You're kidding me. That's crazy. He identifies a Peronist. Wow. With his political approach called Kirchnerism. You can't name everything off of yourself. Okay. Peron. You're no Peron. Okay. Maybe you are, I don't know. One of the most prominent aims of Kirchnerism is to strengthen Argentine relations with the countries of Latin America and to establish a South American economic axis. That's a good idea. Recent economic measures posited by Fernandez's government have nevertheless hurt Argentina's relationship with these countries, maybe Brazil and Uruguay, whose president, Jose Pepe Mojica, expressed worries regarding Argentina going towards an autarkist form of government, the Kirchner economic model, complicated relations, multiplying difficulties by letter. Okay, this is complicated. Legalize same-sex marriage. That's nice. Liberal attitude towards birth control and sexuality. Um, both of which have provoked the opposition of the Catholic Church and other conservative sectors. Well, now that we have a woke, a woke pope, I wonder if that opposition is dialing down a little bit. Yeah. An American hedge fund helped cause Argentina's 2001 collapse. Oh, fully. It's reasonable to assume that if anything bad happens in Latin America, America had a role in it, you know? Boosting the neo-Kinsian economic policies. Okay, I like Keynesianism. I mean, it's not my favorite economic ideology, but of the list that I have to choose from in most elections, this is definitely one of the ones that I care for. Neo-Kinsianism is, you know, there are some, there are some legit. Um, doesn't uh, unlearning economics rep neo-Kinsianism a good bit? Like, ha hasn't he said, like, of the economic uh, disciplines that I could, like, recommend looking into today? What does the Neo entail? Eh, watch uh, Unlearning Economics. Maybe he could fix Argentina. I think he's post-Kinsian. Ah, you're right. He's post-Kinsian, not Neo-Kinsian. That's right. Economic crisis, significant fiscal and trade surpluses, rapid GDP growth. Under his administration, Argentina restructured the default to debt with an unprecedented discount of 70% most month. Okay, this guy seems to know what he's doing. Uh, paid off debts with the IMF, purged the military of officers with dubious human rights records. Whoa, hold on. I'm starting to like this guy a little bit. Purged the military of officers with dubious human rights records. Okay, all right. Okay, okay, all right. Okay. Nullified and voided the full stop and do obedience laws. These are the laws that made it so that the military was just following orders. Haha. <laughs> Ruled them as unconstitutional, resumed legal prosecution of the junta's crimes. He did not run for re-election. Huh, one and, one and done. That's, one, that's all he needed, I guess. Promoting instead the candidacy of his wife, Senator Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, who was elected to... Wait, I recognize this woman. Is this... Is she still operating as opposition? Or... No, no, no. She'd be too old by now. Or is she? Was she the woman who was up there next to Millet when... Because there was a woman in a dress, and I said the dress looked nice. She's the current leader of Peronism. Oh, okay, okay, I thought I recognized her. I thought, yeah, okay. Huh, all right, well, we're catching up to the present day. And subsequently re-elected in 2011. Wait, when they, when they changed the Constitution to give presidents two terms, did they also switch from a six-year to a four-year term? I guess that makes sense. See, elected in 2007 and re-elected in 2011. Kirchner's administration established positive foreign relations with countries with questionable human rights records, including Venezuela, Iran, and Cuba. Oh, Wikipedia, f off with this framing. You're supposed to establish positive foreign relations with everyone except for your literal active 
military enemies. Our unwillingness to establish positive foreign relations with Iran is one of the reasons why we rely on Israel to assassinate their nuclear weapons program scientists rather than just, you know, maintaining a, 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 a treaty we had with them that we broke under Trump. That's a big part of it, Danny. Yeah. While at the same time, relations with the US and UK became increasingly strained, by 2015, the Argentine GDP grew by 2.7% and real incomes had risen over 50% since the post menem era. Despite these economic gains and increased renewable energy production and sub subsidies, the overall economy had been sluggish since 2011. Man, it's crazy how every time you get on the bad side of the United States, the economy does badly. It really, hmm, I wonder what's going on there. November 2015, after a time for the first round, center-right coalition candidate Mauricio Macri won the first ballotage in Argentina's history, beating Front for Victory candidate Daniel Scioli and becoming president-elect. He was the first democratically elected non peronist president since 1916 that managed to complete his term in office without being overthrown. What a victory. Took office in December 10th, 2015. Inherited an economy with a high inflation rate and in poor shape. In April 2016, the Macri government introduced neoliberal austerity measures. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Dude, oh, neoliberal austerity measures. You know, what if we did this? Oh, okay, what if we did, like, for the state intervention? Blah, 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 blah. Under Macri's administration, economic recovery remained elusive, with GDP shrinking, inflation totaling 240%. Billions in U.S. dollars issued in sovereign debt and mass poverty increasing by the end of this term. Man, I wonder if neoliberal austerity measures don't work. I wonder. I'm wondering. I'm thinking. The last time you had a neoliberal, we literally just read about this, his reforms briefly worked and then all the same problems came back. The only period of economic prosperity you've had any time recently was with a Keynesian in charge. I wonder why. I, oh, okay. This is one of the problems with Peronism not meaning anything. The average voter in Argentina probably doesn't know anything about politics, like less than the average American voter. I mean, you guys voted in Malay. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm allowed to say that. Malay is even more unserious of a candidate than Trump was. Political brain damage in this country. Mass poverty, he ran for re-election, but he lost by nearly eight percentage points to Alberto Fernandez, the Justicialist Party candidate. And back to Peronism. Fernandez, uh, wait. President Alberto Fernandez and Vice President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. Okay, so she's VP now. Okay took office in December 2019, just months before COVID-19, and other accusations of corruption, bribery, and misuse of public funds during Nestor and Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner's presidencies. Interesting. Misuse of public funds. The K-Money tra Trail. Did they, did they prove that that happened? Mr. Kirchner, the... has diverted money to tax havens... This did happen. This is real. It's not just trumped up charges or whatever. My recommendation is that don't do corruption. Okay, that's my suggestion. No, they only had proof of assistance of hers doing it. Oh, oh, wait, is that true? No proof. Bayes was sentenced to 12 years, but Bayes was um, alleged partner and businessman Lazaro. Bayes, journalist, concluded that he diverted it to tax havens, arrested for corruption. So was any evidence ever brought against... Okay, I, I don't know. On the 14th of November, 2021, the center-left coalition of Argentina's ruling Peronist party, Frente de Todos, Front for Everyone, lost its majority for Congress in midterm legislative elections. In 2023, he announced he would not be re he, er, seeking re-election. And then it was Javier Malay against Sergio Massa. Wait, we this guy's already a purple name. Okay, he's already a purple name because we've looked into him before in the context of Malay. So what was this guy's deal? People said he was just like a corrupt establishment candidate. I'm sure he is, but like, what? Finance minister? Okay, suspicious, I admit. Break with the Kirchners. Finance minister during economic crisis. Okay, so this guy's probably a neoliberal, right? He wanted to maintain Argentinian social democracy and maintain the state-owned companies. Well, that's not very neoliberal. Finance guy when finance went to shit. Okay, okay, so he's, yeah, okay. So, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't even matter. Mille won. We'll see, I guess. And then we have Millet. And here he is. 
a uh, like genuinely one of the least serious political candidates to ever win in a democracy. And I mean that I genuinely think that if you went through every democratic election, every fair one, uh, in human history, this guy would probably be in like the top three. Oh, infinitely less serious than Trump. Yeah, no, no, 100% less. Yeah, no, Trump makes this guy look like a fuck. Yeah, no, Trump looks like a goddamn scholar compared, uh, compared to this guy. Have you seen him talk, like, publicly? He's insane. Argentina's not a real country. I agree. Okay, guys. Um, I, I feel like we learned a lot of really useful stuff. I, I'm actually really happy with this. We haven't done a research stream in a while, and this this stream kind of gives me hope for doing more in the in the near future, too, because, uh, yeah, we, we learned a lot. We're not experts on anything related to Argentina, but at the very least now we know of a hell of a lot more about it than we did before. I'd like to do something like this for Brazil as well. And frankly, also Venezuela? We didn't, yeah, I, you know, maybe we could make it a more common thing, you know? You're wrong, this dude is an actual economist. No, no, he, he's, he's not a real economist. He does have a degree in economics, to be sure, but it's for the, like, Mises School of Economics. Have you seen his research papers? I have, because I watched Unlearning Economics go over him. He's insane actually insane literally i i don't know what green mill he's getting this shit like fucking insane there's a reason why no real economists not even politicians like cite anarcho-capitalist literature or objectivist literature when they make decisions truly insane yeah I, I, my big takeaway from this first of all is that you guys should watch unlearning economics videos um hold on He's been doing live streams. In fact, he recently did a live stream where he went over here. Javier Malay's nonsensical economics makes me tear out my remaining hair and get it because he doesn't have much hair left. And he goes over like a bunch of statements and like papers that have been cited and like bits of his research and like stuff that he's written. Um, so I really recommend taking a look at that if you want to learn more on like an economic side of things where things are likely to be headed with Argentina. I think that Argentina has an incredibly rough future ahead of it, and I genuinely don't know how much hope there is. I think that, like, I think that uh, right now Argentina and the UK are in the same category in my mind as, like, dying countries. The difference being that the UK is dying very, like, slowly and in a depressing fashion, whereas Argentina is about to die in a spectacularly exciting fashion that'll be studied for centuries. <laughs> so... Um, you know, I, so I, yeah, it's a wild card. Have you looked into the bill Malay sent yesterday? No. Running through an omnibus law that will give him authoritarian extraordinary powers for four years with no legislative checks. Protesting will be a crime. Striking workers will be imprisoned. Privatize everything. Bring in foreign corporations. Wow. That's cool. I love, I, I love, again, like, Malay is going to serve as the most um direct example of how libertarians are just fascists ever that all of their prattling about being anti-government they are actually more like aggressively pro-government control than basically any other ideology in fact i would say that like libertarianism in a way is actually more fascist than fascism because fascists usually have to take some time to build to this but libertarians are definitionally psychotic which means that they just like let's go let's go dude oh let's, let's go dude like I, it's like it's like they're so incoherent they leapfrog into fascism faster like fascists dip their toes in to get in you know they have to like lie about uh like worker labor populism but libertarians are just like oh i just realized i can't do all my insane economic stuff if people are protesting the only way to keep them from protesting is to f kill everyone who disagrees whatever yoink you know Incredible stuff. Fucking hard right fascist property right defender. The nanosecond anyone showed any dissonance or or like anyone tried to unionize, it wouldn't have been because like there are plenty of times through the game that that Ryan is like you know I don't like how things are going, but it is the free market. But he didn't like. I mean, he does not to the extent that he should have. I think like there were crackdowns, but I I don't think that was sufficiently examined to be honest. And also, a lot of the crackdowns were kind of mutual. Like there was mutual fighting with the dock workers too, right? In reality, I feel like um, 
you know, I, I, I don't know. I feel like more could have been done to examine that. I feel like in a way he was almost too principled to be real. Maybe that was the point. Maybe it doesn't really function as a takedown of libertarian economics if you make him a fascist, which he would be, but then people will just be like, oh, well, I simply wouldn't be a fascist. That's why my libertarianism would work. I don't know. He literally does that in the game constantly logs. Okay, I haven't replayed Bioshock in like 10 years. Maybe I'm maybe I'm not remembering it as much. Okay, okay, no, no, no. If I'm wrong on this, it's not like I have a perfect memory. I don't remember it that way, but it has been a while. I need to play Bioshock 2. I've never played Bioshock 2. I don't... I've heard it's not as good as the first one, but it's still pretty good. Play all three. I've played Bioshock Infinite. He takes over Fontaine's businesses. Ah, you're right, he does. Okay, yeah, hmm. Okay, yeah. H Bomber Guy says Bioshock 2 is the best. H Bomber Guy says Dark Souls 2 is the best. He's a fing contrary. <laughs> Except when he's right, in which case he's actually true and based. I I I dude, I I I need H Bomb to make a video dumping on Skyrim. Maybe he can't because he already made one on Fallout 3, and Skyrim and Fallout 3 are the same shitty game. Uh so it'd be really repetitive. It's like it'd be all the same criticisms, you know? I, I feel like he could make it entertaining though, because, you know. He did? Yeah, I know he did. Okay. Guys, I just spent four hours reading Wikipedia out loud. I'm not going to lie, my throat kind of hurts. I am going to read donations that are here, and then I'm going to head. I'm also going to take one more moment to say... Ah? I like it. I like this shirt. I like this shirt. It's not very seasonal right now, but it will one day be summer, or spring, again. 